I woke up one morning in my cabin, located deep within the Alaskan wilderness. My name is Jasper Holland, and for the last few months I have taken refuge here while trying to finish my latest novel. This place never ceases to amaze me, surrounded by lush forests and a serene lake perfect for fishing. My neighbor, Deirdre Gallagher, often talks about how pleasant it is to live in such a quiet corner of the world. Today, as I was getting ready to head out for a quick hike, Deirdre mentioned a gruesome discovery in an abandoned cabin nearby with a sinister scene inside. It's like something straight out of a crime show, she said with a nervous chuckle. Intrigued but doubtful about its authenticity, I decided to explore it with my friend Archibald Thurman. As we approached the creepy cabin, thick fog made it difficult to see. It took some time before we noticed traces of blood near the entrance. Inside, it only got more disturbing overturned furniture, and walls smeared with gore indicated violence had occurred here. The nauseating smell overwhelmed us. As we examined the scene further, we found the skeletal remains of someone who had seemingly died in this very room. It appeared that they had been gnawed on by some creature. Archie shared a story about an elusive beast rumored to reside deep in these woods something never caught on camera or recorded by any hunters. Unable to shake our curiosity, we contacted Maynard Buford, an expert tracker living close by, to investigate this morbid mystery further with us. Leaving behind our families and mundane jobs for several days would be difficult but necessary if we were to find out what happened here. Our first night camping near the abandoned cabin was dark and cold as we huddled around our improvised fire pit sharing stories about our everyday lives over canned beans and toast. Rain fell heavily all night long until morning, leaving the ground wet and slick underfoot. As we delved deeper into the woods in search of clues, we discovered something chilling a series of claw marks on several trees and a series of crumpled bullet casings scattered nearby that appeared to have been rendered ineffective against their target. This was no ordinary creature. The following days only grew more bizarre as we found remnants of clothing and various keepsakes. We interviewed people living in the outskirts who claimed they had heard nightmarish howls from the direction of the cabin but were too scared to investigate. It seemed some predator was stalking the shadows, waiting for the right moment to reemerge. During one restless evening with Archie and Maynard sharing uncomfortable glances, we felt a sudden presence observing us from the darkness while the fire's flickering light cast shadows upon unfamiliar territory. I'm certain I saw yellow eyes glowing within that black void momentarily before they vanished without a trace. Emboldened by these sinister circumstances, we doubled our efforts and began setting traps while carrying our firearms at all times. It wasn't much comfort against an elusive foe, but it was all we had. Cautiously, we started following a trail through dense vegetation that suggested anything larger than a bear had been making its way throughout these woods leaving behind only destruction and panic in its wake. Soon, we stumbled upon something no less disturbing another decaying carcass that unmistakably belonged to someone who had gone missing weeks ago. The bloated, gruesomely disfigured corpse lay sprawled out amidst the shrubbery with tufts of fur clasped tightly within its hands as if it met its end wrestling with the creature responsible. We'll find you. I whispered aggressively against the oppressive silence surrounding us. Wearily, we set up camp once more as night began encroaching upon us again. Our nerves frayed like ripped wires under unbearable tension. We barely slept. Our only solace came from the occasional muffled conversation between Maynard and Archie as they discussed tracking techniques and equipment they had left behind in their vehicles. My body trembled with both exhaustion and fear, as I knew that resting could turn out to be the last thing we did. But we had no choice. Our bodies and minds couldn't endure the relentless pursuit any longer. 
Archie took first watch while Maynard slept, and I struggled to shut my eyes and find even a fraction of solace. Just as I was drifting into slumber, an agonizing screech echoed through the trees, snapping us into full alertness. Archie wasted no time reacting to the sound, firing his gun in the direction of the disturbance. Maynard grabbed a flashlight and aimed it in that same direction, hoping to catch a glimpse of our tormentor. My heart raced as tendrils of terror wound themselves around every thought, but we had to keep moving. We tracked any noises and scavenged for broken branches or kicked up leaves, all possible evidence that something had recently passed through. As daylight slowly leaked its way into the sky, our pace became more feverish. We knew that time was running out for us. Our decision not to call for help didn't cross our minds. Something told us on this wild goose chase that backup wouldn't fare much better than we did. The creature lurked in our peripheral sights like an ongoing nightmare but didn't attack us directly. Instead, it seemed content watching from a distance and calculating its moves, pushing our sanity to near-breaking points. Throughout its increasingly daring encounters as it circled us like a predator ever closer to its prey, several things began to stand out about this malevolent being. It possessed protruding yellow eyes sunk deep into its bony skull, a primal gaze that bore into your soul, while menacing canine teeth jetted outward from its lipless mouth with blood-stained fur surrounding it. Its body was unnatural in shape a twisted amalgamation of bones and taut muscles stretched over an uncomfortably elongated skeleton. As we stumbled in desperation, we found ourselves back at the rotting carcass we'd discovered earlier. Panic tore through my chest, realizing that we'd been traveling in circles for what seemed like an eternity. The creature had expertly herded us straight back to where it wanted us. The next few moments became a blur, its swift movements a deadly dance of death and blood as it finally lunged for its attack. Maynard screamed as the creature sunk its razor-sharp teeth into his arm, tearing flesh from bone. Archie aimed his gun at the beast but struggled to maintain focus amidst the chaos. Maynard, with strength I didn't know he had left in him, fought back against the creature's onslaught pushing it away long enough for Archie to squeeze off a shot that caught it square in the chest. The monster screeched in pain and released him. It turned its gaze on Archie and me before bolting back into the woods, leaving behind a bloody trail of gore and destruction. A heavy silence weighed upon us, a silence broken only by the gasping breaths of Maynard who lay on the ground clenching his mangled limb tightly. Archie dropped his gun and hurried over to Maynard's side. We fashioned an improvised tourniquet using whatever materials we could find on hand before making our way out of the woods, our lives left forever changed by the nightmarish events. The harrowing experience became a permanent reminder, a dark mark etched into not just our minds but also our hearts, of what lurks just beyond humanity's comprehension. In remembering Maynard's final sacrifice as that horrifying monster unleashed its wrath upon him before retreating back into obscurity, we could only speculate about what kind of evil force we'd encountered, some ancient species whose existence should have been buried deep within those densely wooded shadows and never allowed to roam free in our world. No definitive answer surfaced in our remaining days and secrets continued to cloak the creature as murky and impenetrable as the foliage that shielded and sustained it. We had faced it, survived it, but its memory would follow us for the rest of our lives. A monster not bound by myth, legend or folklore, but existing within the cold, brutal reality of nature's darkest intent— and we knew that we could never look at those deep, dark forests the same way ever again, always aware that something sinister could be lurking just beyond our sight.
I remember the first time I set foot in a peculiar area of Aikigahara Forest. My name is Zebulon Finch, and as a search and rescue officer for the United States Forest Service, I've seen my fair share of odd things in the woods. This particular section has locals sharing stories about a sinister presence lurking within its depths. Upon arrival, I partnered with a couple of local rangers named Norval Desmond and Hildegard Warner. As we embarked on our journey, Norval joked about how we ought to be prepared for any eerie encounters. Little did he know how prophetic his words would be. The first nightfall brought an unsettling quiet. Hildegard mentioned how this forest wasn't known for its silence. Crickets should have been chirping away. The silence felt heavy, but we shrugged it off and continued our trek the following day. Towards noon, we discovered what can only be described as a grotesque scene. Several mutilated animals lined the ground, as if arranged in a bizarre ritual. Organs hung from tree branches like twisted ornaments, leaving us deeply disturbed. Conversing about the possible cause, we couldn't avoid mentioning poachers or some deranged psychopath. Hildegard noted that no animal she had ever encountered was capable of such an act. Our unease grew thicker than the eerie fog surrounding us as we continued walking. Each step felt heavier than the last. That evening, I spotted something moving quickly among the branches just ahead, far too large to be any common creature. Norville and I approached cautiously to inspect it, faint shapes darting between trees before vanishing entirely. Trying to make light of the situation, Hildegard asked whether our mysterious visitor might send us an RSVP to dinner. An awkward silence followed her attempt at humor before Norville chucked sarcastically, saying that he'd prefer not receiving such an invitation. Later that night, Norville set out on his own recon mission with the original intent of only taking a short trip. We heard a blood-curdling scream and knew something terrible had unfolded. Hildegard and I scrambled to our feet, grabbing flashlights and following the source of the sound. After an agonizing search, we came across Norval's lifeless body further deep in the forest. He had been brutally torn apart, limbs twisted, bones snapped, and blood splattered everywhere. The shock of this gruesome scene consumed us. All that was left of our colleague was an unrecognizable mess. Hildegard noticed tracks nearby, large, clawed footprints leading off into the darkness. Quickly agreeing on the necessity of vengeance, we were determined to put an end to whatever murdered our friend. Grabbing whatever makeshift weapons we could find, we pursued the creature responsible for Norval's demise. Delving deeper into a Kigahora forest, we chanced upon a cave hidden beneath intertwined tree roots. Our flashlights revealed traces of blood streaking along its walls. Hildegard muttered under her breath that it resembled some sort of haunting gallery. The cave opened up into a larger chamber filled with scattered animal remains and scratch marks etched deeply into every surface. Hearing movement from within the shadows, our hearts pounded in unison, adrenaline coursed through us as we braced for confrontation. A sinister growl echoed from deep within murkiness as a monstrous beast emerged. Standing over eight feet tall and covered in thick matted fur that reeked of death, it was hideous beyond imagination. Its deformed muzzle curled back to reveal jagged teeth dripping with malice. I could see fear in Hildegard's wide eyes as she gripped her improvised weapon tighter, resolved to take down this mysterious, malevolent force. The creature lunged with a roar, claws extended to strike a deadly blow. Dodging its swipe just in time, we counterattacked with everything we had. We fought desperately, swinging our makeshift weapons in a vicious rage. We landed some blows— but it barely seemed to phase the monstrous creature. Hildegard spotted a tangled mess of vines and branches nearby, glancing at me with a sense of urgency. It was clear we needed a way to slow this beast down if we had any chance. Running to the vines, 
We grabbed one end each and tried our best to be one step ahead of the murderous creature. Ducking and weaving, we managed to wrap the vines around its legs and body as tightly as possible. Stumbling, it finally slowed down for just a moment. It was then that we looked at each other, knowing we had to get help immediately. Considering our cell phones lost signal deep within a Kigahara forest, the only option left was seeking help in person, contacting the authorities about this relentless monster. With more adrenaline and fear than ever before, we raced through the dense foliage towards the forest's outer borders. Bursting out of Aikigahara Forest and onto a nearby road, we hailed down a passing car, pleading with them incoherently to contact authorities about the murderous creature that claimed Norval's life. The driver agreed to help us reach safety and contacted the authorities immediately. From there, all we could do was wait nervously for their arrival. The police arrived with search teams in tow while questioning Hildegard and me over every inch of this nightmare what detailed description we could muster of both Norval's mutilated body and that ghastly monster lurking deeper within the forest limits. Led by our account of desperation and terror, they ventured into a Kigahora forest with increased caution. Hours felt like an eternity as we waited for any news all while hoping they would find Norval's remains as evidence for these unfathomable events. It wasn't until the early hours of dawn that the search team returned, weary and shaken from their own brushes with the creature. Miraculously, they had located Norval's body. There would at least be closure for his family despite the gruesome nature of his death. The officials also discovered more remnants in the hidden cave collected animal remains and sketches drawn onto muddy walls that hinted at its perceived lair. It became evident we were dealing with an intelligent creature, beast or not. When it came to capturing this vile force, however, it eluded their grasp. Ultimate success remained uncertain as it slipped away into the night, but the murderous beast would be pursued and hunted down until its end. Alerting the public of its existence and threats, local authorities worked tirelessly to establish a perimeter around the Akigahara forest. Hildegard and I were released once our stories aligned but haunted by our close encounter with such a malevolent force. We could only hope it received the justice it truly deserved for Norval's tragic death not led up until this nightmare was eradicated forever from our lives. Time moved forward but the memory of Norval's gruesome fate was never forgotten. While stories of a Kigahara forest spread whispers through neighboring towns and cities about its terror within those darkened woods, we held hope one day this horrible tale would end conclusively with the capture and destruction of whatever brutal fiend lurked within a Kigahara forest. I remember choosing a relaxing day to hunt in the Allegheny National Forest in Pennsylvania. My name's Norbert Driscoll, and I've been hunting since I was a teenager. My father introduced me to the activity. It was always a great way for us to bond and escape daily life pressures. As a seasoned hunter, getting ready meant checking my gear, packing some food, and loading my rifle in the truck. Everything seemed typical, but little did I know it would turn out to be the most bizarre and terrifying experience of my life. Before leaving home, my brother Rainer called about picking up his kids from soccer practice. I joked that it'd be a logistical nightmare and hung up the phone on that light note. The sun was shining, trees were swaying gently in the wind. It was a perfect day for hunting. Arriving at my usual hunting spot deep inside the forest, I admired the dense foliage that provided solitude and peace. Birds were singing their morning songs as I treaded carefully, scanning for deer tracks and following them deeper into the woods. Little did I realize this would be anything but an ordinary hunt. Hours went by, with no significant luck, only spotting an injured fox limping away. 
As dusk encroached upon the surrounding landscape, an eerie stillness engulfed the woods. No rustling leaves or birdsong anymore. This strange atmosphere prompted me to take extra precautions. I decided to return to my truck when I stumbled upon something horrifying— bloody remnants of what seemed like shredded clothes worn by another hunter like myself. A sickening chill ran down my spine, a profound feeling that I needed to get out of there fast. As if on cue, I heard a sound behind me, an ungodly growl echoing through the darkness. Its sheer intensity made my heart race with intense fear. Slowly turning around, sweat pouring down my face, before me stood a creature straight from my darkest nightmares. Its eyes, piercing and predatory, burned into me as I stared at its otherworldly face. The creature's skin was a sickly, putrid green, and it appeared almost humanoid yet animalistic in nature. Powerful muscular limbs with elongated sharp claws added to the horror. Managing to whimper out a, What are you? Before instinct took over. I raised my rifle and fired, the bullet striking the monster's chest. To my surprise, this seemed to enrage the creature even further. It let out another deafening guttural roar as it lashed at me with its wicked claws. The impact carried a searing pain as blood oozed from my arm. Knowing an ordinary weapon wouldn't be enough to kill this supernatural abomination, I began to retreat desperately seeking safety while fumbling to reload my rifle. Panic-stricken, contemplating whether I should call Rainer for help, but what could he possibly do against this thing? My feet stumbled on like league weights as I tried to figure out any logical explanation for the dreadful entity behind me. The terrifying roar echoed once more through the woods. I scrambled further into the woods my hands shaking as I tried to communicate with Rainer. Rainer, you need to get out of here now. There's some sort of creature here. It's not human. My own heavy breathing drowned out any response from him. My friend's voice finally came through the static. What kind of creature? What does it look like? He asked in a panic. I don't know, but it's strong, fast, and vicious. I'm going to head back to the cabin. Maybe we can lock ourselves in until we can figure out what to do. My hurried words stumbled out as I tried to navigate the trees around me. Complete silence followed. Moments stretched on before Rainer's strained voice came through. All right, I'll meet you there. Be careful. I struggled uninjured and exhausted, each step increasingly difficult and painful. The air was thick with tension as my body sensed the creature stalking me just beyond my line of sight. Then I heard Rainer scream in agony. My heart sunk as I realized he didn't make it back to the cabin in time. The creature had found him first. A sudden burst of determination carried me hastily toward the cabin before the creature could claim me too. I slammed the door shut and locked it anxiously peering through a window to see if it had followed me. The area outside appeared empty until something caught my attention. Tracks. Large prints leading away from the cabin revealed the creature had gone searching for more prey elsewhere. I grabbed my first aid kit and tended to my wounds while trying to calm myself. Running through everything that happened, none of this made sense an otherworldly monster hunting us down in these woods with no explanation as to why or even what it was. Collecting myself, I managed a Google search of recent news stories or events about strange occurrences in this remote area. With the situation so bizarre, my only hope was that there might be someone else from around here with similar experiences that I could contact, maybe even a specialist but there were no relevant results. My search for answers was fruitless. Feeling desperate, I decided to document the creature in case it could be identified later. I took out my sketch pad and began drawing the hideous monster from memory, 
hoping it would give me some further insight into what we were dealing with. Its skin appeared iridescent in the moonlight, reflecting back a lovely sheen that somehow made it even more horrifying. With fangs protruding menacingly from its maw and scales that emanated an unnatural warmth, this abomination remained a mystery to me. My eyelids grew heavy as pain and exhaustion threatened to pull me into an unwelcome slumber. I couldn't risk falling asleep and leaving myself vulnerable, though. No, instead, I would remain conscious despite my fatigue and ensure no one else fell victim to this gruesome predator. Finally, after what seemed like hours of restless waiting and listening, I heard the creature's bone-chilling roar in the distance. It wasn't nearby anymore. We had escaped its clutches for now. Eventually, the sun began to rise over the horizon, signaling that it was relatively safe for us, or rather myself, to make an attempt for safety. I gathered my things and staggered outside towards my truck parked nearby. Every muscle in my body ached with every step, but the prospect of getting away from the nightmarish ordeal powered me through until I reached safety. Once inside the truck, clenched fists uncurled enough for me to make a call to local authorities about Rainer's gruesome death. The hollow feeling of grief ignited within me as they confirmed finding his lifeless body just a short distance from where I found him on one of their searches through these treacherous woods. These haunted trees stretch tall around me, mocking me as if knowing that they will hold tight to their secrets and horrors. The mysterious creature that killed Rainer will remain an unexplained enigma. My only solace is that I managed to survive that horrific night and will live to share our gruesome encounter with others in hopes of preventing any more senseless deaths at the cruel hands of this merciless beast. I've always had a knack for finding trouble. Or maybe it's the other way around. Trouble has a deeply unnerving ability to find me. It's like I've got some bizarre cosmic magnetism that attracts the kind of situations you'll never find in a job description. My work with the U.S. government took me to clandestine corners of existence, notably to this one secluded facility deep in the forests of the Pacific Northwest where whispers don't echo and one's line of sight is swallowed by ancient trees. And it was right there, hidden where you'd hardly stumble upon civilization, let alone a coffee shop, that things took a turn for the worse. It was on a particularly overcast and dismal morning as I walked with my colleague, Philomena Crudge, through the high-security corridors of our research complex. You ever think trees gossip about us? Philomena asked whimsically as we passed one viewing window after another exposing fathomless woods. The question was her attempt to lighten the dour mood that my last night's failed experiment had cast over us. I chuckled at her remark. If they do, I bet they've got some dirt on you. I retorted, playfully nudging her arm. Our banter was cut short when we entered the main experimentation area to check on specimen VX-29, a genetically modified. Well, that part is classified. Our journey inside the restricted zone never prepared us for what we would discover next. Our head of security, Bartleby Gorse, lying on the floor in an unnatural pose that suggested he'd met his end in a horrific struggle. His radio crackled with static like it was trying to scream for help that would never come. A false step around these creatures and your history. Philomena whispered under her breath as she backed away from Bartleby's body slowly easing towards an emergency phone. But there were no footsteps leading up to or away from Bartleby's final resting spot. Nothing disturbed except him. Throughout our facility resided creations of calculated chaos born from CRISPR-edited genes, a convergence of science and fiction one wouldn't expect outside those slim volumes in bookstore corners labeled as fantasy. Yet here they were, 
living evidence that human hubris rarely comprehends its consequences until it's too late. We notified director Marlo Quinton about the incident via secure lines while carefully avoiding unnecessary detail over such an insecure medium. Unspoken truths best delivered face to face. I noted down some observations when something caught my outside. A fleeting shadow tracing along the fringe of visibility where Trilene met building perimeter. As we stepped out into the crisp air prepared for anything with sidearms at ready, we called them insurance policies around these parts. I recalled Bartleby once jokingly saying he felt like Red Riding Hood every time he ventured outdoors here, checking every shadow for the big bad. Well, this time, nobody laughed at his joke because he wasn't there to tell it, and what stalked us amidst those trees guaranteed no happy endings. Marlo Quinton met us at rendezvous point Charlie brimming with questions but tempered by concern for our well-being. It wasn't every day death knocked on our not-so-metaphorical doors. Words failed me as I attempted to articulate what didn't make sense— how could anything escape without triggering a dozen alarms? How did Bartleby end up lifeless before anyone witnessed an anomaly? Lockdown of Sector Zulu is immediate. Marlowe declared crisply taking command with an authority she wielded like others might carry concealed weapons. Let's find our wolf. The facility transformed under lockdown protocols while tracker teams organized quickly. Our oversight committee did not take kindly to mortality rates rising within their secret petri dishes. I followed silently, questions thrumming through my mind unanswered as we advanced within thicket yet unexplored by human folly. The search itself felt predatory much like what hunted perhaps even now watched us closing distance between civilization's edge and nature's rugged embrace still undisputed here in these silent woods. Teams split up approaching suspected lair locations designated Alpha through Echo, each locale chosen based on analysis so cutting-edge that university lecturers would still be calling them science fiction for years to come. We moved as one, our steps silent on the crunching forest floor. Marlowe led one group. I followed another. Our destination was location Alpha. Hands tensed on weapons— Eyes darted to every shadow between the trees. We had one job, find the cause, contain the breach. Minutes turned into hours. We scoured each site with precision, nothing out of place, no sign of intrusion or struggle, but the chill in our spines grew deeper with each passing moment. The teams regrouped at base. Our faces told stories of stale trails and unanswered questions. Suddenly, Thompson from Echo Team slumped to the ground. Wide eyes stared up at nothing. A ghastly silence enveloped us all. His body bore marks, deep, precise, almost surgical in their infliction. No one dared to speak the horror that gripped us. This was not an accident. Marlowe spoke, her voice void of its usual command. Report back, she ordered and we gathered around the grim sight. Backup was hours away. We were alone with a nameless threat roaming free. Night descended and with it a tangible dread. Orders came in clusters. Check equipment. Secure the perimeter. But it felt like token gestures against an invisible menace. We barricaded where we could and sent distress calls using encrypted channels. No reason for silence now that death had found us twice over. Thompson's demise lay before us, a stark reminder that we were not hunters but potential prey. Sounds broke through the night, a rustling distinct from nocturnal creatures' typical stirrings. It led away from Alpha and towards Echo's last known position, the direction from which death had come for Thompson. Marlowe formed two teams— one to stay behind at base camp and another to investigate the sound under her lead. I was in the latter as we traced steps once familiar now sinister with implication. What awaited shocked even seasoned operatives among us. 
Wilcox from Echo Team lay broken against a tree, life gone from him too soon. Injuries mirrored those found on Thompson, precise incisions bearing evidence of intelligent force. Witnesses spoke of quick movement through treetops and shadows detaching themselves from darkness, impossible yet real recollection stained with terror's mark. No clues pointed towards this creature's origins, yet its existence could not be denied. The damages inflicted were too acute for doubt or disbelief. Daylight offered no comfort or solace, only clear sight of destruction wrought upon two of our own. Teams regrouped under heavy hearts but clear purpose. We must leave this forest untouched by man's ambition, thus preserve what stalking force called it home. Our exit was methodical despite palpable fear. We left markers for retrieval teams to find Wilcox and take up where fallen comrades left off. Sector Zulu remained under lock until further notice, a silent testament to folly of man's reach exceeding his understanding, and somewhere deep in untouched thickets lay secrets best undiscovered by mankind's hands or minds. Death came without warning, yet not all fell before it. Survivors carried burden of reflection and memory. Bartleby first, then Thompson, followed by Wilcox, left behind waiting for answers that may never come while forests hold tight their ancient, untamed enigmas unyielding beneath civilization's touch, however fleeting it proved this time around. I always thought remote roads had their own brand of silence, the kind that lets you hear your own heartbeat over the truck's engine. I'm Gibson Tyrell, a truck driver by trade, hauling cargo across the lonelier parts of Wyoming. Days meld into nights, one dusty small town bleeds into another, and so on until you forget the feel of a firm handshake or the sound of bustling streets. This particular route took me through barren plains brushing against the whispering rock ridge. Just past an aged diner and a gas station with pumps old enough to be museum pieces, the road starts to promise freedom but often delivers something else entirely. Serenity? Maybe for some, but for me, it was the grim solitude of my cab and my thoughts. Early in my run, I noticed a silver sedan on my tail, keeping pace. Nothing unusual, a fellow traveler seeking comfort in another's path perhaps. As miles stretched out, it became apparent that something was off. The car would vanish only to reappear closer than before. It wasn't until the sun dipped below the horizon that things turned foul. Rolling through an unremarkable stretch, my rig jolted. There was a definite thump from below. Pulling over with caution practice from years on the road, I checked the cargo, still secured, then took a lamp to inspect the tires. There it was, the unmistakable indication of sabotage, spikes fashioned crudely but effectively with ill intentions scattered around my wheels. No cell service out here, no passing traffic to flag down, no sudden bursts of heroics would play out in this story, just me and whoever laid these traps. Retreating up toward my cab, I glimpsed movement near my trailer, a shifting shadow separated from the others painted by moonlight. The figure was large and deliberate in movement with intent written in his approach, a man unfamiliar in face but known by his posture, an antagonist cast perfectly for dystopian narratives. Ignoring his approach would have been foolish. Confronting him meant playing into his narrative. At that moment, rational thought gave way to survival instinct. I sprinted back to my cab's safety, but not before glancing back to etch his features into memory. Towering frame wrapped in nondescript clothing marred by patches of dirt, or maybe blood, hands, no gloves enough to wield pain or engineering disaster for anyone unlucky enough to cross paths. The silhouette didn't pursue me into the glow of my headlights. Instead, he lingered beyond reach, 
visible enough to affirm threats without uttering a single word. Settled back in my seat, my mind raced for solutions as grim as scenarios played out unfettered by typical restraints like heroics or timely rescues. But amidst that inner turmoil sparked clarity, this monster hunting me held attention unwavering on me now. Did he leave others behind? Missing persons couldn't tally themselves, and given stretches like these, with trembling hands more from adrenaline than fear, I know freight routes aren't normally crucibles for bravery. I keyed up my radio hoping some lone ham operator might break all odds and pick up my distress call. Static crackled through the radio as I tried to send my distress call. There was no response, just a hiss that turned into a mocking silence. I reasoned against calling 911 for fear that it might be too late by the time help arrived, given the remote location of these freight routes. Besides, there was no direct threat I could describe without sounding like I'd lost my grip on reality. I decided on another course of action, driving. I turned the ignition and pushed the accelerator, glancing in the rearview mirror to see if he followed. The road ahead was clear, but the man haunted the edges of my vision. He followed at a distance, appearing whenever I checked my mirrors. Hours passed with the same routine until the fuel gauge warned of an imminent stop. I pulled into a station that had just one other occupant minus a trucker named Carl who eyed me with concern. I whispered my situation to him while we stood outside pretending to check our tires. Carl frowned at my words and glanced around before pulling out his own radio handset, attempting to contact others nearby. His tries were met with static similar to mine. We decided that he would follow me for safety in numbers. We left the station, convoy style, with Carl behind me in his rig. A sense of false security washed over me as miles passed without incident. But then I saw him again standing at a crossroad as if waiting for us. Carl saw him too and radioed me a warning to speed up and not stop for anything. This cat-and-mouse game continued until dawn broke, bringing some normalcy back into view along with other vehicles and presence of life outside our desperate bubble. It was then we saw it, a car upturned off-road, still smoldering from an accident or perhaps something more sinister under his hand. Carl stayed back to report it while urging me to continue towards civilization and law enforcement where I could safely describe everything except for the antagonist's name. His identity remained elusive despite everything I witnessed. We departed ways only when police took over and started piecing together what had happened with their expertise rather than freight drivers trying to make sense of madness on desolate roads. They found more vehicles later that day, each scene painted with signs of struggle and fallout from violent encounters. They didn't make it out like I did. I think about them sometimes even as weeks pass into routine again. Their memories avoided dying in vain. They helped us realize there was an active murderer marked by distinct traits, dirted clothes, relentless pursuit, Silent intimidation lethal up close. Law enforcement pieced together those stories until they arrested someone fitting that exact description in a neighboring town after days filled with investigation and roadblocks. They couldn't make him talk during their interrogations, but the evidence spoke loudly enough for them all. Fingerprints at each scene screamed his guilt. So eventually they identified him, Marcus Tilly a name now synonymous with terror on these roads. His arrest meant relief slithered through every shaken driver's spine, including mine. Survival wasn't just instinct minus it was reality now sustained by calm breaths rather than frantic sprints away from dangers personified by Marcus Tilly. And life moved on, steadily like our rigs across long stretches of asphalt except now we drive more carefully knowing what may wait beyond our headlights reach if vigilance ever falters again.
I check my watch and realize I'm late for my patrol through Redwood National Park. The dense fog makes the already imposing forest seem endless, a cathedral of nature where one can easily lose their sense of direction. My name is Leander Kenton, and being a park ranger S.I. Finer Woods typically means quiet days filled with the rustle of leaves and occasional wildlife photography enthusiasts asking for the best spots to capture deer in the golden hour. On this particular patrol, I note something unusual, a car parked at an odd angle by the side of an access road not far from Stout Grove. In my years here, I've learned that people often underestimate the wilderness. The vehicle looks abandoned, door ajar with no sign of its owner. Concern gnaws at me. Missing persons aren't unheard of in these parts. I radio in the find but get only static in return, an unwelcome reminder that nature often disrupts even our modern devices. With no reply, and knowing the nearest help is miles away and unreachable, it's up to me to investigate. I approach cautiously, noting a map spread across the passenger seat and camera equipment on the back seat but no personal items like wallets or phones, a bad sign. The air seems to thicken with the scent of pine and earth as I venture deeper into the forest following a trail of scuffed earth that suggests someone passed here recently. I remember my uncle teaching me to track in these very woods, his lessons now invaluable. The stillness is jarring not a single bird call or squirrel chatter disturbs it. I cross paths with an old hiking trail that isn't maintained anymore, one that leads towards an area where visitors are discouraged from going due to hazardous terrain. It's there I spot torn fabric from a jacket caught on a bramble evidence that someone indeed went off-trail. I follow, aware but skeptical of how quickly situations can turn grim out here. The path gets rougher, leading down towards a creek known for rapid rises in water levels. As I reach the edge where water should be calmly flowing, instead I find signs of struggle. Footprints suddenly stop, and drag marks take their place toward an ominous cave entrance on the other side. Deciding against calling out which might trigger a rock slide or worse, if something inside is causing harm, I tread carefully over rocks testing each one before putting full weight on it. Concealed by shadowy moss-covered boulders near the cave, I finally catch sight of it, a hulking figure, its back toward me, seemingly dragging something, or someone, into its lair. Its size is monumental easily twice mine, covered in dark matted fur like an animal yet standing upright, a grotesque parody of human posture. Its limbs are long and disproportioned while claws glisten wetly at its fingertips. My pulse races as my training kicks in, maintain distance, observe quietly, protect yourself if necessary. The creature halts as if sensing my presence, releasing an earth-shaking growl before disappearing into darkness, dragging its quarry behind it. I turned and ran, my breath ragged with panic. I had no weapons and even less of a chance against something that large. I rushed back toward the trail I came from, putting distance between myself and the cave. I needed to find help. Trees blurred as I sprinted but one thought kept me grounded someone had been dragged into that cave. Stumbling back onto the main trail, I collided with a pair of hikers. They steadied me, their faces etched with concern. Someone's hurt, I gasped out. In a cave back there, a figure, their eyes widened. Cell service was non-existent here. We need to get park rangers, one said already turning to leave? The urgency in their actions matched my own fears. We split up they went for help while I waited at the trailhead to lead rescuers back. After what felt like hours, rangers arrived with gear and questions. They followed me back to where the dragged marks began. The creature was gone when we reached the cave again, but the person it had taken wasn't fortunate. 
A man lay prone at the cave's edge, a friend perhaps who had wandered too far from campgrounds, searching for adventure and confronting terror instead. His wounds were grave, inflicted by something strong, with sharp claws that left deep gashes. Rangers declared him dead at the scene as they called for recovery teams on satellite phones. The only connection to outside authority here in this isolated expanse of wilderness. The creature remained unseen, but evidence of its existence was undeniable now. Its hair found clutched in the man's fingers will puzzle conversation for days to come. It was evening when they took his body away, evening when reports and recountings vibrated through official channels. Evening when quiet whispers spoke of encounters unheard of before all within mere days. More rangers arrived. Campsites were evacuated. This slice of nature turned from idyllic retreat into guarded zone, while teams searched for answers that my mind shied away from acknowledging fully. I left not long after, knowing wilderness sometimes conceals things beyond our understanding things that remind us of our fragility within these vast green expanses. The man's name became known in whispers around campfires eventually, a memento against venturing too far off marked paths where nature holds sway unchallenged. His name was Tom Bennett, an unfortunate victim whose demise underlined an untamable truth. Some parts of nature remain untamed and unsympathetic to human intrusion. That evening marked an undeniable shift. Warnings grew stern around trails where others might become prey, an ending punctuated by loss but necessary for safeguarding lives from here on out. In the heart of Pinalino Mountains, Arizona, where the dense woods blur the line between tranquility and isolation, I stood watching a fire tower, perched above an ocean of pine and spruce. My name is Booker Teller, a man seeking solace after life's relentless tribulations. The forest was my sanctuary, but it soon turned into a stage for a grim episode. A local hunter by the name of Elgin had visited me on a crisp June afternoon with harrowing news of his dog, found in pieces near the Sundance Trail. Despite my responsibility to remain at my post, Elgin's pleading eyes compelled me to investigate. The scene was beyond vile. The dog lay eviscerated with clinical precision. This wasn't the work of any predator I knew. Unease wrapped around my gut as I considered human malevolence not wild hunger might be at play. Days trickled by without further incident until radio contact from the nearest town relayed concern over two missing hikers. I should have related this information to authorities, but inexplicably felt compelled to explore this myself. Suspicion and intrigue shadowed me as I trekked through thickets that seemed unfamiliar in their sinister stillness. I found one of the hikers' camps abandoned. Among the scattered gear, patches of earth were upturned violently, the soil dampened with more than just the mountain dew. A half-burnt journal belonging to a Serafina detailed unnerving encounters with someone lurking just beyond their campfire's reach each night. Underneath a waxing gibbous moon, I resolved to keep watch from within the nethermost regions of shadowed trees that night. My breath short and measured, eyes darting. Silence mocked me until it was broken by the scrunch of footsteps deliberate and paced approaching the camp. There was no humor or ease in my confrontation with him as he stepped into Moonlight's grace. His name was Merritt, an artist who sought to capture death's essence through methodically crafted scenes using nature's unwilling participants. He smiled as he told me his truth deranged philosophy winding through his speech like ivy around a gravestone. Nature, he said coolly, only respects those who show strength. And nothing shows strength like dominion over life and death. I stepped back and watched Merritt with a calm focus, 
knowing confrontation could escalate the situation. I had no signal out here to call for help and going deeper into the woods meant losing any chance of a call. Besides, I lacked the training to handle a suspected killer. He began to walk toward the forest, and I knew he intended to lure me away from the camp and possibly toward another of his macabre installations. In his hand, he held a small, sharp tool used for carving. His eyes never left me as he backed into the shadows. With my heart beating at a steady pace, I made a choice to not follow but instead head in the opposite direction. As night fell, under cover of darkness, I found my way back to town on a route that kept me hidden but in view of clearings and moonlit patches where someone might pursue. At daybreak, I reached the town and informed the authorities about Merritt, relaying what he'd confessed. Search parties found nothing but Merritt's are deep in the woods, twisted forms representing both human and animal subjects in unsettling unity. Then one search team found something else, footwear impressions too large for any known predator but not quite human either. They matched nothing they had seen before. They led deeper into uncharted territories far beyond where they'd found Merritt's sculptures. No one knew what made them or wanted to find out, minds teetering between fear and disbelief. We never saw Merritt again after that night. His fate became one with the mountain secrets, a curious blend of human malevolence with an insinuation of something more primal hidden within those woods. The missing hikers were never found and townsfolk whispered about legends never recorded or spoken before, a creature that showed strength through dominion over life and death, forces beyond our comprehension or jurisdiction. I remembered Serafina's journal and how it spoke of encroaching dread. Now it made terrible sense. We mourned our missing neighbors and erected barriers around known entry points to the wilderness as if that could prevent further tragedies linked to whatever lurked in those mountains. Life continued with a wary normalcy, respect for nature intermingled with caution against its unfathomable facets, evidence taped off as an exhibit of human horror adjacent to possible enigmas of wild origin. Sometimes strength lies not in confrontation but in acknowledgment of our limitations against inextricable forces we may never fully grasp or see. I woke up with a pounding headache after a long night at Murphy's Bar, celebrating Jerome Winter's birthday after work. My name's Tom Verkley, and I live a pretty simple life working at the local hardware store. Took over my dad's old job when he retired. Married once, no kids, and my buddies were really all I had in this small town of Ashby, Nebraska. After getting dressed and stepping outside of my apartment building, I noticed a crowd gathered just down the street. Conversations filled the air and police sirens punctuated the unsettling scene. I approached my friend, Pauline Zerbel, who was visibly shaken up. "'What's going on?' I asked. "'Somebody found Del Stanford's body just behind that building,' Pauline whispered to me, pointing at an old bookstore. "'You mean Del from the post office? That doesn't make any sense,' I replied as my heartbeat quickened. Who would do something like this? We don't know yet, Pauline said, her voice cracking. As the week went by, more bodies were discovered in various locations around Ashby. People began locking their doors and staying inside after dark. The town was on edge, gearing up for a wave of terror that we never saw coming or dared to imagine. It was time to take action before our once peaceful town became unrecognizable. A group of us banded together, Jerome Winters, Pauline Zerbel, and another friend named Bryce Elster formed our little investigation squad. We took it upon ourselves to put an end to these gruesome murders when it became clear that the police were getting nowhere. 
We began searching for any possible links between the victims or anything out of place in town. As we returned from interviewing Dell's relatives one evening, a chilling sight met our eyes when Bryce pointed toward an alley between two buildings an unnerving figure, seeming almost inhuman. The creature stood over six feet tall, its scaly and wet-looking, greenish-brown skin glinting under the streetlight. Adorned with sharp spikes along its spine and arms, the monster resembled something reptilian and otherworldly. It didn't notice us at first it was busy dragging a lifeless body into the darkness. Without even thinking, I grabbed my phone and dialed 911. But as I pressed the call button, a dead silence filled the air. The creature suddenly turned and stared directly at us with chilling yellow eyes. Run! Jerome shouted past the terror silencing us. We took off in a sprint headed towards Jerome's truck parked just a few blocks away. As we piled in, I saw that Bryce had been injured during our escape, his pants leg torn open by one of those spiky claws that our monstrous adversaries seemed to have in abundance. Gasping for breath as Jerome floored the accelerator, we bolted out of town to get help and recollect ourselves. How could something like this be happening here? Pauline cried out, her voice choked with fear and disbelief. Between his heavy breaths, Jerome offered a shaky response. We need to find a way to let people know what's going on. Larry Eisen will believe us. He's got connections all throughout this town. Larry owned the local newspaper office if anyone could help spread the word quickly or point us towards someone who could fight this beast, it would be him. We hurried to Larry Eisen's newspaper office, hoping that he would be able to help us. Upon arriving, we banged on the door, desperate to get his attention. The door opened slowly to reveal a worried-looking Larry. What's going on, guys? Larry asked, assessing our frantic state and Bryce's leg injury. Forcing words through my racing heart, I tried to explain the situation quickly. We saw a creature. It dragged a body away. It attacked Bryce. We need your help. Larry lost no time inviting us in and tending to Bryce's wound. After bandaging it up as best he could, Larry turned his focus back to our harrowing situation. You're not making much sense, Larry said skeptically. What kind of creature are we talking about here? Reptilian. Jerome choked out. It had spikes all over its body and yellow eyes that stared right into you. Larry felt the gravity of our story and nodded solemnly before shifting gears. I'll make some calls to local authorities and my connections around town. In the meantime, why don't you all stay here for now? It's safer. As we waited for Larry's help and resources to arrive, we barricaded ourselves in his office with whatever furniture we could find. We hoped that no one else would have the misfortune of encountering this creature. A couple of hours later, a team from a nearby city arrived with unexpectedly professional-looking gear after hearing our pleas for assistance. They turned out to be specialists in dealing with unknown dangerous creatures. We can't thank you enough for coming. I said as I shook the hand of their team leader, who introduced himself as Agent Martin. Just doing our job, Martin replied with an air of confidence that seemed contagious as his team got straight to strategizing on how best to deal with this fearsome reptilian monster. Within no time, they had formed a plan and began setting up traps around town, hoping to catch the creature before it could hurt more people. Armed with tracking devices and night vision goggles, they coordinated their efforts with Larry, who used his local expertise to identify possible hideouts. Throughout the night, their efforts yielded little success. However, during the early hours of the morning, one of their tracking devices triggered, indicating that the creature was making its way towards an isolated warehouse on the outskirts of town. Immediately, Agent Martin and his team headed to the location, 
cornering the reptilian creature as it feasted upon another lifeless body. The team engaged in a tense standoff with the beast at their side willing to be the first to take action. Martin muttered a command into his radio, initiating their plan in full force. Flash bangs exploded around the creature in a deafening cacophony as team members surrounded it with precision. Caught off guard by the sudden onslaught of light and noise, the creature thrashed wildly as tranquilizer darts were expertly fired into its tough exterior. With more than ten tranquilizer darts embedded in its greenish-brown skin, the reptilian monster finally fell unconscious. The team slowly approached it, cautiously ensuring that it was truly incapacitated. As they shackled and secured it onto a transport vehicle hidden a safe distance away from prying eyes, we couldn't help but feel a mixture of relief and trepidation at what we had just witnessed. The truth about this monstrous being was still so far from our understanding. Agent Martin shook our hands once again, assuring us that they would closely study our uninvited visitor. You're brave for contacting us, he commended. We won't let this happen again. In the weeks that followed, life gradually returned to normal though nothing could erase what we'd seen or replace those who were lost. Larry made sure the newspaper documented our ordeal and kept its readers informed as the investigation unfolded. It became clear that the creature was something far beyond our comprehension, an extraterrestrial being stranded and hungry. For us, life would never be the same. As we mourned the lost lives at a vigil organized by Larry, we could only hope that this terrifying chapter of our lives had come to a true end. I stepped outside the cabin, taking in the peace of my surroundings. My name's Wilson Grantley, and I was eager for a weekend away from the city. The tall trees in the woods of upstate Washington enveloped the small clearing that held my rented refuge. Birds sang overhead, and the sun filtered through the branches, creating dappled patterns on the ground. In need of firewood for later, I grabbed an axe and went to work splitting logs, making an efficient stack next to the cabin door. As the day progressed into evening, I managed to catch up on some reading in my cozy hideaway. The gentle sound of a babbling brook nearby lulled me into relaxation. As night fell and only moonlight illuminated my surroundings, I took notice of a shadow at the edge of the cabin clearing. A figure towered in an unnatural stance. Unable to decipher its features in detail, it seemed like a great mass leaned forward on long, twisted limbs that ended in large claw-like hands that dug into the forest floor. It didn't appear human nor animal, something completely other. Startled by its sudden appearance, I debated calling for help. But without internet or cell signal out here, my only option was waiting until sunrise and driving back to civilization so I remained silent and motionless while examining this strange creature. In a single fluid movement, it darted swiftly toward a nearby tree trunk before disappearing from sight again. Heart pounding in my chest, thoughts racing through my head as to what it could be, maybe an escaped circus performer with incredible physical skills. Suddenly realizing that I had closed off any escape route for myself by renting this secluded cabin with no neighbors around only added to my fear. Should I risk making noise by barricading myself inside? Amidst these internal debates on how to react logically but still maintain security, dark humor crept in through morbid jokes about my curious predicament taking hope in the thought that I might be simply hallucinating from too many crime novels, I could only continue observing, hoping for an opportunity to better understand what lurked at the edge of my sanctuary. I watched as it appeared to snatch a young couple who unwittingly wandered into the clearing. 
They were desperately trying to navigate back to their nearby campsite in the darkness when they suddenly vanished. My stomach churned as I realized they wouldn't be escaping their grisly fate. The creature re-emerged, revealing grotesque details of its form. Countless small eyes like black pearls set deep into a gnarled and mutated face. It moved with unnatural agility and speed, its claws still embedded in the remnants of its prey, their mangled bodies like ragdolls from clenched jaws. Terrified yet unable to take my eyes off the unfolding horror show before me, I decided that escaping my cabin in an attempt to warn others would bring me directly into contact with this nightmarish behemoth. My unyielding fear and uncertainty forced me into a paralysis of silent voyeurism as the horrifying incidents continued. A local patrol officer ventured into the forest due to reports of local missing hikers. His primary mission a search and rescue before it became another morbid statistic on unsolved disappearances. Heavy steps cracked branches underfoot, undoubtedly catching the creature's attention. It swiftly leaped onto a tree trunk about two meters above ground level like a predator lying in wait for its prey to pass within striking distance. The sound of his approach grew louder and louder until it stopped just east of my cabin. There was a deafening silence followed by the raspy sound of tense breaths. The officer called out hesitantly if anyone was there, seemingly aware that something was not right but remaining bound by duty and logic, either wanting nor able to accept such monstrous possibilities looming out of sight in this dark forest. The words had barely left his mouth when the creature lunged, letting out a guttural screech, a sound I can only describe as pure, unbridled terror. The officer's gunshots rang out fruitlessly against the unstoppable beast as it bore down upon him. The creature, a bizarre amalgamation of familiar and unknown, had an elongated snout filled with serrated teeth. Its body appeared vaguely humanoid, yet movements betrayed unnerving speed and agility. Atop its cloven hooves were legs bending the wrong way and extensions flexing like an unnatural contortionist. The fur covering most of its form seemed tainted by ages of filth and burrs, giving it the appearance of a poorly groomed animal. Suddenly, it gripped one of its victim's limbs with its terrifyingly powerful claws and pulled brutally, detaching it from the tormented patrol officer's body like overly ripe fruit from a tree. Seconds later, another sickening rip devoured flesh before my horrified eyes. My mind raced in desperate search for any semblance of hope. No chance for escape presented itself. If I tried to flee, that monstrous beast would undoubtedly hear me, paralyze me with terror as it barreled toward me, and that would be the end. Then the thought struck me that if anyone else were remotely nearby— they could face a similar grisly fate without warning. As quietly as possible, I retrieved my phone from my pocket. With shaking hands, fingers pounding at the screen until finally reaching the emergency number to report this unthinkable scene. All while praying fervently under my ragged breasts this call wouldn't attract the creature. The operator answered briskly, their usual confident demeanor briefly faltering upon hearing my voice choke with horror. They asked for my location while I whispered as tersely as possible about the deaths and monstrous assailant waiting for me outside. Stay calm and remain where you are, they assured me. Emergency services are on their way. Though heart pounding furiously in my chest, I continued clutching the phone as I peered out the window helpless to do anything but watch as more lives fell victim to this supernatural predator. Emergency sirens pierced through the silence, drawing the creature's incessant interest. Its head swiveled toward the approaching vehicles, distracted momentarily from its slaughter. Stepping backward with animalistic caution, it slipped further into the forest's shadowy depths but not before casting a final glance towards my cabin with a sinister gleam in its glowing red eyes. More officers poured into the area, 
along with several emergency medical personnel attempting to treat any remains that could be saved. But it was all too clear that no one had survived this beast's ruthless assault. In the following days, investigators scrambled to make sense of the incidents. I hesitated to elaborate on the creature's inexplicable appearance and abilities, fearing mockery or worse, being held responsible for these brutal deaths. Only vivid descriptions remained of that nightmarish attacker pressuring their search for answers from which I'm convinced will never be found. While forensics and law enforcement worked tirelessly on the case, public hysteria reached fever pitch as theories abounded concerning bloodthirsty, unseen animals lurking among our homes waiting to strike at any moment. Eventually, life began to return to whatever semblance of normal could be managed in light of such horrors. A sense of collective loss weighed heavily over everyone. I found myself shunning my friends and family in fear that they too would befall an ill fate at the hands, or claws, of this creature hiding somewhere in our very midst. Months passed yet that chilling memory refused to fade away completely. Sometimes when I'm alone in my cabin, surrounded by nothing but night's darkness creeping ever closer, I can't shake the feeling as if it's out there somewhere, lying in wait, biding its time until once again it brings terror before vanishing into oblivion as suddenly as it appeared. It always ends the same way, me too terrified to sleep or even think about investigating beyond the cabin's door assaulted relentlessly by the memory of that patrol officer's strangled screams echoing hauntingly through the night air. But even in my quietest, most isolated moments, one singular revelation gnawed at me no matter how I tried to squash it. Those other victims may have never met this unspeakable monster if not for my presence luring it just a few unfortunate steps within striking distance and that thought was the most horrifying realization of all. I never thought my job as a small-town cop in Rockville, Maryland could serve up something like this. My name's Alessio Bingham, and I've been on the force for about a decade now. It was starting like any other shift when I got a call about a disturbance at a local home. Arriving on scene, I met the neighbor who had called us, Altena Hensley. She told me she heard screams coming from the house next door. I approached the property, cautiously knocking on the door. There was no response. With Altena's permission, we entered her backyard to access the neighbor's backyard through a gate that connected them. She went inside her own house for safety. As I walked around to the back of the neighboring home, I saw what looked like claw marks dug into the side of the house. The marks led up to an open window. Nervously, I radioed my partner, Theodore Fleming, for backup, explaining what I found. Upon Fyodor's arrival, we decided to enter together through the window since we had enough cause for concern regarding whoever might be inside. We stepped over broken glass and entered into the dimly lit dining room. Chairs were overturned, shards of ceramic plates covered the floor. This place was a mess. A low growling sound echoed from another part of the house. We hesitated for just a moment before moving towards it. In the living room, we found a horrifying scene, blood stains on the walls and floor with no body in sight. Our hearts raced as we decided to split up to search further. I moved down a hallway toward where the noise had come from. Slowly opening each door along my path only found empty rooms that looked untouched until I reached a locked door at the end. Kicking it open revealed fresh bloodstains and a trail leading under an old laundry chute. I slid into the chute, which opened up in a damp, unfinished basement. There was no denying it. I was following a creature through this house. The growling intensified as I cautiously navigated the dark space. My flashlight swept across the room 
catching glimpses of dirty walls and moldy furniture. Suddenly, there it was, a hideous beast roughly the size of a bear, covered with scales and long, sharp teeth. It had unnaturally extended limbs that looked like they could snap a human in half with ease. As quickly as I spotted it, we made eye contact and the creature lunged towards me. My instinct drove me to raise my gun, but in that moment Fyodor busted into the basement. The creature turned its attention to him instead. Alessio! Get out of here now! Fyodor shouted as he fired multiple rounds into the nightmarish being. The bullets seemed to do little damage, merely enraging the monster further. My breathing became shallow as adrenaline kicked into overdrive hearing Fyodor's command. I radioed for backup, explaining we needed all available units at our location immediately. While waiting for backup, it was impossible to ignore the sounds of Fyodor struggling with this horrific and macabre creature in the basement below. We had no idea what it was capable of or how to defeat it, but one thing was certain— this was not something we had ever encountered before. Backup arrived and without wasting another second, they jumped into action as a team. Fyodor remained locked in combat with the beast like some strange gladiator match while courageous officers joined him in trying to subdue this bloodthirsty monster ravaging our town. The situation seemed hopeless as the creature continued its onslaught. I knew I needed to escape and find a way to help Fyodor and the officers from a distance. They were risking their lives to protect me, and I felt helpless in this moment. I sprinted back up the stairs, trying to create some distance between myself and the chaos ensuing below. As I reached the top of the staircase, I stopped to catch my breath and think of a possible plan. Frantically searching among the cluttered basement for something that could help us, my eyes landed on an old gasoline canister. It was not much, but it was all I had. Picking it up and quietly racing back down the stairs, I doused the creature with gasoline as it struggled against the officers. The hairs on my neck bristle as it let out a furious roar. Fire! We need fire! I shouted hoping someone would understand my desperate plan. One of the officers spotted a flare gun among their supplies and tossed it in my direction. With shaking hands, I took aim at the gasoline-soaked creature and pulled the trigger. The flare burst into life and flew directly into the monstrosity's chest. For a moment, time seemed to slow as we watched in shock at what was about to happen. The creature caught fire almost instantly screeching in pain as its skin began to blister and bubble under the intense heat of blue-red flames. The officers wasted no time. They dragged Fyodor away from the burning leviathan towards safety while others provided cover fire. Panic surged through me as smoke filled my lungs. My vision blurred as we stumbled further back from ground zero. Despite our best efforts— one of our fellow teammates did not make it out of that basement alive. Officer Sarah Williams had fallen victim to the wrath of this unknown entity we never should have encountered. Within seconds, we found ourselves escorted outside the building and into the fresh air. The inferno raged on, engulfing the house and hopefully extrinsicating this unnatural abomination from our world. When the fire department finally arrived— not much remained of the building except for charred rubble and bittersweet memories. Fyodor survived but was severely injured. We hoped the medical team could help him recover in time. Days turned into weeks as we tried to piece together what had happened to our quiet little town. No one dared speak of the inhuman menace that brought terror to our streets. We had lost a brave officer that night— and nothing could ever replace that loss for her family. During that harrowing nightmare, countless hours were spent attempting to analyze and understand what exactly we fought against. Without any previous experience or knowledge of such creatures, 
we were only able to hypothesize what its species might be based on its physical features and the aftermath left behind. With no other known occurrences, it remained a morbid mystery, one we hoped never to encounter again. Eager to return some semblance of normalcy to our lives after this ordeal, we resumed our everyday routine as best as possible while never forgetting what we faced. We worked tirelessly to protect our community from whatever else could lurk out there in the darkness. If anything similar ever threatened our town again, we vowed to be ready. But sometimes I still dream about that night, about Officer Sarah Williams who died right there in front of us at the hands of something none of us understood or could begin to explain. That memory will forever haunt me. Life went on, but underneath it all was a new feeling of uncertainty, a sense that anything can happen in our world, and sometimes horrors beyond comprehension emerge from nowhere. Even still, hope does not cease as long as people like Fyodor and Officer Williams are willing to step up and face those terrors head-on. In their bravery, our small town found the strength to move forward. In the remote stretches of Montana's Bitterroot National Forest, far from any marked trail, I grapple with my first season as a fire lookout. My name is Eamon Hughes, destined to spend months isolated in a tower scrutinizing the horizon for any lick of smoke that could signal disaster. It's a lonelier gig than I'd anticipated when abandoning city life, disconnecting from my ever-droning existence as an accountant. My days fall into a pattern as monotonous as my old job, scan, log, eat, sleep. But not tonight. Tonight there's excitement, vicious and repugnant, that shatters routine. At quarter past three in the morning my radio crackles. A voice infringes on the static, a fellow lookout, Raleigh Benesit. Amen. Must be your first dead radio, he rasps. There's urgency laced with something akin to fear, an emotion hard-bitten Raleigh seldom allows himself. Following his coordinates leads me to a clearing where the soil's color has turned unforgivably crimson, a crude map of horror set against pristine nature. Above the coppery reek, gleaming under the crescent moonlight is flesh, remains too mangled for overwhelmed senses to piece back into humanity. Nothing in training prepared me for this grotesquerie. Words falter. Silence rules our exchange until Raleigh chokes out a conjecture about it being the work of an animal, something native but gone rogue after a taste of easy prey. Jolene Sibley joins us at daybreak, a tracker renowned across counties for her prowess. Despite her skills, she brings forth no clear answers but confirms that whatever resulted in that savage artwork evaded all typical wildlife patterns. The following nights bleed one into another with rabid apprehension throbbing in my chest each time darkness crawls over these woods. The killer, creature or not, leaves evidence of its twisted existence horrifyingly close to inhabited spaces. Raleigh tells sour jokes over the radio sometimes, a desperate humor echoed by crackling waves and rustling leaves. Why don't some couples go to the gym? Because some relationships don't work out. It evokes laughter because the alternative is surrendering to dread. Then comes another night that etches new scars upon my memory. More blood-soaked ground and Jolene murmuring curses as her eyes trace signs only she can interpret. Whatever assaulted this forest bounds through terrain with either remorse nor hesitation, an apex predator distinguishing itself from all familiar menaces. Our next step seems almost pedestrian compared to our newfound reality. We try to anticipate its path based on past attacks a feeble attempt by humans trying to fit disorder into our own patterns of logic and prediction. Tonight is for waiting, 
for staring into dark so deep it stares back with hungry intentions. And then there's movement that doesn't belong, barely perceptible if not for hours spent learning these woods' language by heart. It nears Raleigh's tower first. He shouts terse warnings over our shared frequency. Raleigh's voice pierces the static. It's here. I grip the radio tighter, heart racing. Where? North side, moving fast. Jolene whispers into her headset. Prepare yourselves. We know protocol. No confrontation. Preserve life. Observe. Report. Jolene and I find higher ground, an outpost with a clear view. Raleigh stays put. His tower overlooks the north path. The creature emerges beneath moonlight, a hulking mass with fur that glistens with dampness. Muscles ripple under its coat as it moves with grace despite its size. Fangs flash as it tears through the bush. A bear? No, larger, with eyes that catch light like no animal. We need backup. I whisper into the radio. Jolene nods. She's seen enough to know we're outmatched. We can't outfight this beast. Can't. Raleigh responds, voice steady despite the fear he must feel. Storm took out the road's east side. It's just us tonight. This revelation cuts deeper than any claw. The helplessness takes hold. The creature stops, sniffs the air, detects something in our direction. Stay still. Jolene commands softly. Silence settles like a weight, broken suddenly by a blood-curdling scream from the direction of Raleigh's tower. It charges. We hear commotion over the radio. Metal twisting, glass shattering, then silence. Minutes stretch like hours until Jolene moves to check on Raleigh. I follow at a distance, well-trained instincts commanding my steps. What remains of Raleigh's tower speaks of brutal violence, twisted steel and spatters painting a gruesome scene. In the carnage lay Raleigh, or what was left of him. He stands no chance. We retreat under cover of darkness to plan evacuation come morning light, for us and anyone we can warn. The creature looms somewhere in shadow. Its very existence a harrowing question left unanswered but marked by death and horror. Dawn finds us leading survivors away from a nightmare forest. The image of blood-stained leaves and fur burned into memory alongside the sound of our friend's last breath. They'll send others, Jolene assures as we walk on weary legs. Better equipped? Maybe so but we leave knowing some beasts defy classification and elude capture, predators beyond current understanding but all too real in their savagery, their hunger etched into the bark and dirt, a silent testament to nights of terror realized. The story will be recounted many times, in whispers and shouts, but for those who endured those harrowing days, it remains ever-present, a stark reminder that sometimes survival is about fleeing from darkness too deep to fathom. I still hear the snapping twigs when the silence of the forest presses against my eardrums. Being a fire lookout in Idaho's wilderness was supposed to be an escape a respite from the cacophony of urban existence. On clear days, I could see almost fifty miles in any direction from my tower endless waves of trees and the jagged outline of distant mountains. Solitude was my only companion, until last Wednesday. Not an animal nor breeze breaking the stillness that day, only the heat and a faint sound that grew into a chorus of rustling leaves. The visitor log at my station hadn't seen an entry for weeks passers-by were rare. The radio only crackled back with updates on weather or the occasional check-in from other lookouts. That morning, though, I'd found something unsettling, a shredded backpack not far from the base of my tower contents scattered as if by force, 
including a notebook soaked through with rain and blood. I reported it straight away, but help was hours out. Roads don't come easy this deep in National Forest's lock, my nearest counterpart one ridge over, radioed his intent to swing by once his shift ended. I spent the afternoon restless, pacing wooden planks that creaked underfoot as though they too sensed unease. Lock didn't show by dusk. The forest held its breath. No birds sang their even song. As shadows pulled around the trees' bases, I strained to see movement amidst their trunks, hoping for Locke's familiar form. Instead, what emerged was either man nor beast I knew but something hollow-eyed starved to its desperate limits. It started with the deer. They had developed this peculiar twitch. It wasn't natural movement but jagged, like marionettes dancing on splintering strings. It should have been enough for me to signal distress then and there. But isolation can veil one's judgment like fog across morning meadows. Documenting became obsession as dusk became night inching closer until details of what wasn't right about these creatures filled my pages. If Locke saw my observations posthumously or what constituted low reached here. Even now I scrawl with trembling hands as lantern light sways, thought patterns fracturing like ice underfoot. The sight gripped me whole, those eyes upon me from beneath a buck's crown magnified mania incipient within me how long since another voice? My bones felt encased in ice, every instinct screamed flight yet here I stood entrapped by its perusal, could its sense heartbeat rapid like rabbit cornered? What followed remains fragmented in recollection sounds perhaps indicating struggle or pursuit yet never confirmed for fear paralyzes beyond mere physical restraints when fight or flight becomes freeze or frenzy. A crashing report amidst timber lanced through night's fabric relief poured like summer rain as notions compiled what had to be lock arriving brusquely. Firearm always close despite peaceful solitude professed our creed. Shouting pierced as I called into shadowed woodlands, yet response returned not in kind, just echoes mocked over dense canopies. Locke didn't come. The shot I heard, it came from elsewhere. I stood still, listening. No steps followed the sound. With each passing second, the hope that it was Locke faded. Fear got the best of me. I sprinted back to the cabin. The phone there would be my lifeline. But as I reached for it, the line was dead. Panic gripped me then, for contacting outsiders was impossible. Miles of forest isolated us from nearby townships. Hours dragged on with no sign of lock. It was just me and the creature outside. I secured doors and windows best I could. The creature seemed to play a sick game. It moved silently then suddenly attacked the walls unpredictably, its strength on display with each dent and crack it made. Body long and emaciated, skin mottled with unhealable wounds, it looked human only in the vaguest sense. Lengthy limbs bent at unsettling angles, fingertips ending in nails sharp as knives it was a living weapon aimed at anyone who crossed its path. It didn't talk but its intent was clear through its relentless assaults. When daylight broke, there was an eerie silence. Safety seemed uncertain but tangible. I decided not just to survive but record this, to make sense of what transpired if only for posterity's sake or a warning for others who may encounter such horrors. I found Locke at dawn's light two days later, or rather what remained of him. A scene so vicious and cruel laid before me, his end painted with nature's cruelest brushstrokes. Need drove me out of those cursed woods towards civilization to share my tale, to caution others about what prowls in hidden shadows where we think ourselves dominion holders. I leave this account here for you now, an echo of warning to not disregard those subtle signs that nature warns us with when balance has been disturbed by something far more sinister than anything our rational minds can comprehend.
I woke up startled, a sound outside my window grabbing my attention. My name's Tomias Whitebird, and I'm a park ranger working at the Black Hills National Forest in South Dakota. This was not how I expected to spend my evening off from work. Being a Native American with roots in the Lakota tribe, I had always felt a deep connection to these lands but never came across anything as eerie as that night. Hesitant, I grabbed my flashlight and progressed cautiously through the forest, driven by an unexplainable urge to investigate. A friend of mine, Lisa Benton, had gone missing days ago and her disappearance weighed heavily on my mind. We shared fond memories of exchanging stories about our unique backgrounds. I chuckled to myself at the thought of the joking conversation we had discussing how our surnames are rarely heard of. Little did I know how soon that feeling would be replaced by something far more sinister. As I continued moving further into the woods, the sky darkened overhead and cast an unsettling glow over everything around me. The tree branches reached out like skeletal fingers as if trying to grab onto whatever walks by their side. Slowly but surely, a stench filled the air, vile and putrid that made my stomach churn. As I pushed away the bile rising in my throat, it became increasingly clear that something was terribly wrong here. Driven by a determination to find Lisa, I covered my nose with my shirt and pressed forward. It wasn't long before I stumbled upon a gruesome scene. A human body lay there mangled and distorted beyond recognition. There was carnage everywhere, limbs strewn apart, dried blood collecting in dark pools covering every inch of the forest floor. At this moment, I should have called for help, but something lodged in my throat choked down any courage left within me. Besides, the closest space was miles away, and this situation demanded immediate attention. As I stepped away with trembling legs to analyze the area, I spotted faint footprints embedded in the ground. It was followed by a blood trail leading into the dense thicket. Cautiously, I decided to follow the trail when abruptly something crashed through the foliage. Struggling to keep my composure, I gripped my flashlight tightly and shone it towards the sound. A creature not of this world stood before me, horrifying scales covering its body, several arms and legs with talons scything through the air, and black eyes that seemed to contain an abyss that chilled me to my very core. Paralyzed by fear, a flood of thoughts raced through my mind, each too complex to fully grasp yet equally terrifying. When suddenly a deafening roar filled my ears, I knew that survival was all that mattered now. Hoping for a fighting chance, I scrambled into action. The creature lunged at me with impressive speed, but I was quicker this time and rolled aside. Failing to find its target, ravenous hunger gleamed from its eyes. It swiftly spun around and flailed its icy claws in anticipation. Seizing an opportunity amidst retreats, spectacular leaps and dodging razor-sharp talons, our movements resembled an intricate dance where one misstep could lead to a fatal conclusion. In our brutal exchange of offense and defense, I noticed something peculiar. The beast recoiled when passing an area filled with torches illuminating my surroundings. It was then that a sliver of hope appeared. I spent years learning about these reservations and their legends but never thought any of them could be true. Knowing that many tribes used fire not only for protection but also for rituals against evil spirits within our culture, it dawned on me how essential it would be to create a barrier between myself and whatever creature this may be. I knew it wouldn't guarantee survival as this being possessed strengths and abilities unrivaled but the look of dread within its eyes temporarily subsided my own fear. As I snatched a torch from its holder, it became clear that this creature wanted to stalk me no matter where I went, a foe with relentless dedication but who still longed for shadows to swallow it whole. With the torch in my hand, I tried to keep a safe distance between myself and the creature, 
using it as a makeshift barrier. My heart pounded as I backed away, my eyes fixated on the beast's appearance. Its massive form was covered in a dark, matted fur, and its snout filled with crooked teeth, gnashing hungrily at the air. Its limbs were long and muscular, ending in icy claws that threatened to shred anything within its reach. As I found my back against a rock wall, panic began to set in. It seemed impossible to escape this relentless predator. Suddenly, I remembered my cell phone tucked into my pocket. Desperate for help, I pulled it out and managed to dial 911 with shaky fingers. 911, what's your emergency? The operator's voice came over the line. Please help. There's a, a creature attacking me. I blurted out. What's your location? I'm not sure. I was out hiking near some tribal lands, reservation territory, when this thing came after me. I described the monster as best as I could while continually waving the torch at it in an attempt to hold it at bay. We're sending help to your location immediately, the operator said. Just try to stay safe. Holding on to my lifeline connection with emergency personnel, I began to search frantically for some kind of escape route. When I noticed an opening that led into a cave just behind me, I knew it was my best bet, even if it might be temporary. As soon as I entered the cave, the dim glow from the torch revealed intricate wall markings, which seemed to be older tribal inscriptions etched by hand. If ever there was a clue about what this stalking creature might be or where it originated from, there would undoubtedly be some truth hidden within these markings. The cave became exceedingly narrow, reaching a dead end after a few minutes of walking. It was too dark to continue further. The distinctive growls and heavy breathing of the monster approached, echoing through the winding passage. My hope quickly diminished as I realized there was no escape. But then, as I huddled against the furthest wall, shining the torchlight on the ancient carvings surrounding me, I caught a glimpse of something meaningful. In that moment, I found strength in speaking out loud to the creature. I know what you are! I yelled from deep within my lungs in a last desperate attempt. A high-pitched cry came from the beast upon hearing my words, causing it to halt its stalking advances momentarily. Seizing this chance, I abandoned my fear and faced it head-on, torch held high, refusing to be devoured by this monstrous being. Strangely enough, as I stood there prepared for battle against whatever it would bring forth next, the creature simply stared at me, a curious expression on its twisted face. I didn't move an inch, either did it. I held my ground until flashing lights appeared outside the cave's entrance. My hopes surged with renewed vigor when emergency services finally arrived on the scene. The beast, whatever it was and wherever it had come from, fled with a snarl as more lights shone upon it and human voices echoed around us. The 911 dispatcher asked me if everything was still okay. My trembling response confirmed that help arrived just in time. While unsure of what exactly chased me that night, or why simply acknowledging its presence and existence seemed to halt its pursuit of me, one thing became clearer. Never had I been so grateful for genuine human connection when faced with indescribable terror an abomination violently thrusting me out of my otherwise mundane existence. From that day forward, each time I went out into nature or merely glanced at those old inscriptions etched into my memory, I couldn't help but remember that horrific encounter, the defeated creature slinking away in the face of knowledge and unity. Would it ever emerge again, or would the shadows continue to provide it refuge? I'm Emmett O'Bannon, standing outside the dense forest surrounding the town of Arisland. Today, 
I feel lucky to be a part of Special Task Force Sigma, devoted to hunting and tracking down monsters. During my childhood, I grew up listening to stories about creatures hiding in the shadows. Back then, I never thought I'd make a career out of confronting those fears. We planned a secret mission deep into the woods after several locals had gone missing and gruesome crime scenes were discovered, different from anything we'd seen before. The air hung heavy with unease as our diverse team of experts made its way through thick underbrush. Our team leader, Ulysses Sharp, turned and said, Remember, folks, whatever we're facing out here is unlike anything we've encountered before. Stay sharp, stay focused. A faint chuckle followed his words. As we moved deeper into the forest, we stumbled upon a horrific scene stripped bones, and remains of one of the missing persons lay strewn about the ground. It became real for all of us then. The danger wasn't just in our imagination or whispered local legends. My fellow task force members listened intently as I detailed what we were looking at without using technical jargon and essential skill on this skill-diverse team. They understood that this was more than a mindless killing spree. There was an almost methodical destruction at work here. Hours passed as we tracked whatever committed these acts through the woods until dusk began to settle. And that's when it happened, our first contact with the antagonist. Partially hidden behind some bushes just a few meters away, lay this beast. Its sharp claws covered in filth, and dried blood glistened in the dying rays of sunlight. Its hideous body pulsed with power as it let forth an unnerving growl. I don't recall ever feeling so small and insignificant while looking into its hollow, malevolent eyes. The creature moved around, giving us the chance to observe it. The form resembled some twisted combination of animal and human, yet it was something entirely different from both. Ulysses, with sweat pouring down his brow, whispered instructions. The tension among us was palpable. Each of us carefully tightened our grips on the guns we carried. We aimed for the creature's heart, desperate to end this nightmare before it could hurt any more people. The beast spotted us and charged at an impossible speed. My fellow team members yelled in response but couldn't call for help as they focused everything on fighting the horror in front of them. A violent dance began with us leaping out of the path of those deadly claws and desperately firing our weapons. Our training had prepared us for a lot of things but not this. As the battle raged on, I couldn't help but recall the emotions surging through me during my first field mission. However, this was another level entirely. As we fought on into the night, I managed to glance around and spot Eamon Quinn lying motionless on the ground nearby my friend and skilled shooter whose grin could make everyone around him laugh. Shrouded in darkness and pain, I could only imagine what torment he had gone through only moments ago. We screamed for help, but there was none to be had, no one to come and save us from the nightmarish creature before us. As I dodged its relentless attacks, I feared that our communications were intercepted. What if this creature could tamper with our signals, rendering us helpless and isolated? Desperation gnawed at me as bullets flew through the air. The conflict raged for what felt like an eternity. We defended ourselves as best as we could, but the creature's agility and raw strength outmatched our trained skills and firepower. One by one, my teammates fell to its unyielding assault. The creature tore into them with furor while we scrambled to reload and maintain steady aim at its colossal mass. Ulysses gave a futile order. Fall back! Our team retreated, pursued relentlessly by the beast. We stumbled, exhausted and injured, through dark forests and rough terrain. The creature's howls echoed in our ears, drowning out any lingering words of hope. As we ran, Ulysses instructed those still able to shoot to cover our retreat. During a momentary reprieve from the onslaught, 
I mustered enough courage to call for backup but couldn't guarantee they would arrive in time. We continued our escape with dwindling hope. The wounded were tiring faster than those who remained untouched by the creature's attacks, among them myself, somehow still untouched by claws or fangs. My own gun was nearly spent, ammunition running low with each frantic burst of gunfire as we ran from an enemy that refused to falter. Suddenly aware that our efforts were not enough to stop the attacks, Ulysses made a final decision. He told me and a few others, Get out of here! Find a way to lead it away and rendezvous with backup further down. Knowing there was only one way to stop the creature for now, diversion, I volunteered to lure the beast away. A handful of us, including Ulysses, broke off from the main group, and with as much bravado as my rifle could produce, we opened fire on the creature. The plan worked gaining its attention by diverting fire towards it and blinding it momentarily with a flash grenade, we led the enraged beast on a chase away from our comrades. I didn't look back as Ulysses and I sprinted forward, struggling to stay ahead of those blood-curdling sounds. Finally, after what felt like miles of agonizing pursuit and unrelenting fear, reinforcements arrived in armored vehicles— armed to the teeth with weaponry designed for more robust targets than any human could ever be. As they unloaded upon the monster that pursued us, their military-grade artillery tore into it. I watched as the creature writhed in pain from the barrage but continued to fight fiercely. Eventually, one shot found purchase in its head. The impact caused it to stagger and eventually collapse. The nightmare was over. We stood motionless, heaving breaths mingling with relief and disbelief that we had survived this harrowing encounter. However, there was no time for celebration. My thoughts turned to Eamon Quinn and our other fallen teammates. Their bravery fueled our drive for survival. While experts tried to identify what exactly the beast was, they remained stumped. They assumed it might have been some mutated monstrosity or undiscovered species but couldn't confirm without significant study, a luxury not afforded by our immediate circumstances. Amen and the others deserved better than this nightmare. We carried them out of that awful place and made sure they were remembered for their courage against an indescribable horror none could have prepared for or anticipated. As we drove away from that cursed forest— I couldn't shake the feeling that whatever happened next would change us and how we faced the world. It was no longer just humans and animals. It was something else entirely, a darkness none of us knew existed, and we had stared into its eyes. I'm Simon standing in the dense woods outside Sleepy Hollow, New York. My colleagues, she's Elvilda and he's Orestes, and I are tasked with tracking a creature that's been causing mayhem in this area. We're part of a task force that specializes in hunting monsters, but this one's new to us. Triple check everything, Elvilda says as we inspect our gear. The three of us exchange nods and murmurs of confirmation. Our secret mission starts with locals reporting a string of gruesome incidents, people missing, others found mauled or worse. Every scene is a masterwork of carnage, beyond what most animals could do. I recall why I joined the task force, the death of my sister Elsworth at the hands of a creature we never caught. I draw strength from her memory. Delving deeper into the trees, our senses strained for any clues, I can't help but crack a joke. You'd think with all the Starbucks around here, the creatures would be too relaxed to hunt. Alvilda smirks. Orestes just shakes his head. Later that day, we stumble upon evidence, large tracks leading toward a cave hidden under an old oak tree. The prints are different bigger and more aggressive than anything we've seen before. 
We should call for backup, suggests Orestes with furrowed brows. No time, I reply, thinking of the innocent lives at stake. Whatever this creature is, it won't stop until we make it. Inside the cave reeks of rotting flesh and fresh blood. Then we see it, a nest made from gnarled bones and ripped flesh. It seems this creature has quite the collection. Suddenly, we hear a guttural growl emanating from deeper inside. We proceed silently but cautiously into the heart of darkness. Out of nowhere emerges our target, an enormous, beast-like creature, with razor-sharp claws and horns protruding from its skull. Its eyes are vacant yet full of rage. Our training kicks in. We spread out and swiftly open fire using our specially developed anti-monster weapons. But this creature seems unaffected. It leaps toward Orestes, pinning him to the ground in a shower of rocks and dust. Help! he yells, struggling under the overwhelming weight of the creature. In an attempt to save him, Alvilda distracts it with a well-timed shot while I hastily perform first aid on Orestes. The creature roars again as its eyes dart between us, deciding who to attack next. What now? asks Alvilda, panting. Finish the mission. I say between fast breaths. The creature lunges at us. We dodge and weave amidst flying debris and the crash of shattering splintered wood as we fire back at it. Able to move only with incredible pain, Orestes roars his fury at having been injured by this new foe. Don't worry, I tell him. I won't let what happened to Elsworth happen to anyone else. As the creature lunges toward us again, Alvilda manages to hit a weak spot on its body. It screeches in pain but quickly recovers and decides to target me. I barely dodge the assault, feeling a sharp pain course through my body as one of its claws grazes my arm. We continue fighting with little progress. Our shots keep bouncing off its monstrous hide and our injuries begin to pile up. Finally, I realize we're not going to win this without help. Call for reinforcements! I yell as Alvilda and I separate to avoid the creature's next attack. Why didn't we do that before? She asks in exasperation as she retrieves her radio. We didn't expect it to be this strong. I reply, wincing at the pain in my arm as I prepare my weapon again. Alvilda quickly gets on the line with our commander, requesting immediate backup. The creature snarls and... Sensing our vulnerability, closes in on our position. There is nothing left for us but to stall for time until reinforcements arrive. Orestes struggles beside me, pushing through the pain of his injuries to try and stand. He understands that he might be a liability at this juncture. However, his pride prevents him from staying down. In tandem with Alvilda's continued assault on the creature— Orestes and I manage to find a rhythm between us. He distracts it with a few well-aimed shots while I strike it from another angle. The plan works for a while but isn't enough to cause any significant damage. It seems like an eternity before we finally hear distant footsteps echoing through the darkness. Through labored breaths, we muster our last ounces of strength and continue the fight. However, as soon as our backup arrives, a team of six heavily armed soldiers, they struggle just like us to make sense of which tactics might be effective. The commander quickly calls for a tactical retreat upon understanding the gravity of the situation. It becomes clear that none of us are prepared to handle this beast right now. We pack up everything we can, carrying our injured comrades, and retreat out the way we came. The creature doesn't follow us, perhaps satisfied with the damage it had already inflicted. Back at our base, we regroup and strategize. Medical personnel tend to Orestes and me, while Alvilda reports our encounter to the higher-ups. The room fills with grim expressions and heavy sighs this wasn't how any of us saw this mission ending. But in truth, it's far from over. 
Days pass as we recover from our injuries. We pour ourselves into researching the creature, scouring every database for an inkling as to what it might be and how to stop it. While most of us had no experience with folklore or cryptic species, some of our colleagues bring forward a few obscure leads. Tales of monsters morphing into terrifying forms or mythological beings whose appearances inspire terror in their enemies. Unfortunately, nothing solid emerges from our research. Defeated but not despairing, we're determined not to let what happened to Ellsworth happen again. Those we've lost deserve justice, and all those innocent people who may cross paths with this monster deserve better than to suffer at its hands. A week later, armed with new intel, improved weapons designed specifically to bring down powerful creatures, and a determination not seen since the beginning of our mission, we revisit the lair where so much devastation occurred just days prior. This time, though still apprehensive about facing the mysterious beast once more, an air of quiet resolve gives us hope that we will succeed today. The creature still resides in that dark abode of death, seemingly waiting for our return. As it raises its head and sees us coming, its eyes spark with rage. This time, however, we're ready. We have no idea whether we'll survive this encounter or not, but for those who've fallen, we owe it to them to forge ahead and do everything we can to ensure the creature pays for its actions. Steeled for battle, we charge forward, determined to put an end to the monstrous being that has hounded and haunted us for too long. The grim memory of the tragic events serves as fuel for our drive and willpower as we move forward together as a unified force, intent on delivering justice or dying in the attempt. This happened to me five years ago, just before the terrifying ordeal took off. Demetrius Nolan invited me, Joey Greenberg, on a weekend trip to Huntington Lake in California. Little did I know that my life was about to change forever. Demetrius, his cousin Elsa Porter, and I embarked on a road trip from San Francisco with high hopes of relaxation and hiking through the verdant landscape. Huntington Lake is known for its tranquil waters and towering pine trees that surround the area. The weather was perfect, sunny, yet accompanied by a gentle breeze that rustled the leaves of the swaying redwoods. We reached our cabin after sunset, a cozy wooden building infused with the earthy scent of pine. After cracking open a few jokes about each other's driving skills— we settled in for the evening with a hearty meal that Elsa cooked for us. The second day arrived brought with it a sense of calmness as we explored trails surrounding our cabin. Demetrius' laughter echoed through the woods as we shared stories from our pasts. I remembered my days growing up in a small Midwestern town where nothing ever happened. But as we continued our hike, we stumbled upon an abandoned campsite littered with tattered clothes broken gear, and crimson stains. The sight ignited an uneasiness within us. Something or someone had caused not only chaos but seemingly vanished an entire group of campers. On edge now, we retraced our steps but soon found ourselves lost among an unknown trail shrouded in thick fog. Sudden rustling distracted us and footsteps approached from behind footsteps that didn't quite fit any human or animal gait we knew of. A figure loomed ahead, tall and burly with ragged clothes that hung loosely over his sunken torso. His eyes were hollow pits of darkness. We stood paralyzed as he emitted guttural grunts, saliva dripping from his cracked lips. Then, out of the fog— more of these creatures appeared a group that can only be described as cannibalistic mountain men closing in on us. Their matted hair hung over foreheads etched with malice and hunger, clutching crudely made weapons ready to end our lives. Cornered and terrified for our lives, Elsa tried reaching for her phone to call for help, 
but there was no signal in this desolate corner of the woods. The once innocent invitation by Demetrius now seemed like a trap set by vultures, unseen forces to lure us into their claws. Our humorous banter had transformed into desperate screams for help as we were left with no way to escape these sinister creatures or even defend ourselves against their blades and clubs. Frantically searching for some sort of reprieve, I scoured the ground for any weapon. My fingers clutched a sharp rock as Demetrius stood beside me, breaths heavy with fear but utterly determined not to surrender our lives. Tears filled my eyes as I prayed for a miracle within arm's reach while the agonizing sound of craving bellows ripped through the once peaceful forest. Elsa's voice cracked as she pleaded with her hunter. Please, she sobbed softly. What is it you want from us? Can't we just go back the way we came? The monstrous figure lurched forward instead bearing jagged teeth and emitting a haunting growl that mocked her every syllable. Desperation took over as we realized that neither reasoning nor escaping would bring a quick end to our inexplicable situation. The realization dawned on us that we needed to confront our attackers, and the only way was to face them head-on. We glanced at each other, knowing for the first time in our lives that teamwork and trust were essential to surviving these abominably violent mountain men. These beasts in human form continued their predatory advance, their muscular bodies indicating years of survival through savagery. As if sensing our determination, the men exchanged ominous looks before resuming their grisly pursuit. Elsa, Demetrius, and I huddled together, backs pressed against one another as the mountain men formed a circle around us. We clung onto rocks and tree branches, makeshift weapons that we hoped would prolong our lives for just a few crucial moments. Demetrius locked his terrified eyes onto mine and gave a slight nod as if to say, now or never. We launched ourselves at the nearest men, swinging our makeshift weapons with frenzy. Gritting my teeth in determination, I managed to connect a solid blow to one man's temple as Elsa took down another by swiping his legs from under him. Despite our best efforts and the adrenaline coursing through our veins, we knew time was running out. It was then that we heard it, the unmistakable thuds of footsteps approaching from behind us. My heart lurched into my throat as I realized more of these malevolent beings were swarming in like wolves, ready for an easy feast. As the space between us and the mountain men rapidly shrank, Elsa cried out in sheer terror. It echoed through the forest, punctuated by the merciless growls of our attackers. In a final attempt at self-preservation, Demetrius took off sprinting in no particular direction with Elsa and me not far behind. Our desperate cries must have reached someone, for just as my legs were about to give out from exhaustion, the sound of sirens filled the forest. The melodic wail was beautiful and horrifying all at once. We could no longer tell whether it was coming to save us or deliver us to more gruesome fate. Emerging from the pulsating darkness, a tireless search party of police officers and park rangers had clothed themselves in our would-be liberators. Their presence startled the murderous mountain men just enough for us to break free and commandeer their attention. The officers immediately sprung into action, training their guns on the attackers and yelling commands for them to stand down. Remarkably, some of our pursuers chose instant surrender. But not all. Others attempted to flee back into the forest, or charged headlong toward them with malice in their eyes. The raging screams and gunfire mixed into a cacophony that will haunt me forever. Once the chaos dissipated, we clung together in shock as medical personnel ushered us onto stretchers and administered first aid. The horrifying ordeal had come to an end, but even with these vicious mountain men behind bars, or dead, a sense of closure eluded us, replaced by dreadful memories etched indelibly in our minds. As we rode away in ambulances, 
Demetrius seemed lost in thought while holding Elsa's hand. We can only cling to one another now, thankful for our lives even if they'd been irrevocably damaged by this harrowing event. For as long as I live, I know I'll never forget those terrifying predators hidden within the forest's snaking tendrils. Nor will I ever forget Demetrius' stalwart courage that might well have spared my life. But above all else, I'll never forget that desperate cry that seemed to pierce time and space alike. My grateful heart's own call for help, even if salvation's bittersweet taste lingers as a grim reminder of the night we faced the most unimaginable horrors. This happened to me six years ago. I used to work as a forest ranger in the Smoky Mountains, Tennessee. My name's Warren Yancey. It was an ordinary day on the job when my walkie-talkie crackled to life. Lorraine, another ranger, reported some hikers had found content from disturbed campsites. As I arrived on the scene, I observed several tents scattered about and shredded belongings strewn around the area. Whatever had happened here was devastating. Roan, a fellow ranger involved in the investigation, approached me with a somber expression. Have you seen anything like this before? he asked. No, I replied quietly. How about you? Never. He shook his head, then relayed a joke attempt to lighten our mood. Hey, Warren, why don't some couples go to the gym? Because some relationships don't work out. I let out a chuckle before getting back to work. We noticed the distinctly dense scratch marks around few of the trees nearby. The scratches were deep and brutal. Something powerful had caused this damage. From then on, my daily routine included searching for signs of whatever tore apart these campsites during morning patrols, an oddly increasing phenomenon. One day during lunchtime, Roan and I reminisced about our past to ease the tension of recent events. You know my granddad used to work as a forest ranger too, Roan confessed. I guess it's in my blood. Ah, well, I responded through bites of my sandwich. My dad was into business, but for me, nature called. Our bonding moment didn't last long as both of our walkie-talkies jounced fiercely with an emergency broadcast. Three hikers were discovered brutally injured in an isolated area up the trail. Rushing onto the scene, we found that their clothing swathed something inexplicable. Blood oozed from gashes, and their limbs contorted in unspeakable angles. As we tended to their wounds... One of them whispered a warning between labored breaths. Titi tall, hairy creature, ravenous eyes, shuddered the hiker. Fear crept up my spine, and the other rangers exchanged uneasy glances. Roan suddenly bolted upright, his face pale. Warren, we need help now. Using our walkie-talkies, we requested assistance from HQ. Unfortunately, due to severe weather conditions, they wouldn't arrive immediately. Battling the storm to remain near the crime scene became mandatory for Roan and me. That night in a makeshift tent, Roan shared another joke. Why can't dinosaurs clap? Because they're dead. We laughed nervously, subduing our anxiety over the circumstances. Every noise, branches stirring and leaves rustling, sent chills down our spines. The following morning we had become so puzzled over these horrific encounters that we decided to snoop through the area's history. We discovered that swathes of people had gone missing while traversing these woods across different time periods. As I read through one missing person's case file after another, dread set in. The attacks seemed targeted on specific generations, the time duration between each wave consistent and precise. Was it Lodo Kinsible? Rumored local legend? We should leave, Roan whispered. We're not equipped for this. 
I agreed. But before packing up to evacuate from our search radius, our radios crackled as a report of an attack occurred near one of our favorite leisure spots in the forest, Moonlit Meadow. Without a moment's hesitation, we dashed towards the clearing, with tense beating hearts, to apprehend anything unusual. To our revulsion, Moonlit Meadow no longer encapsulated its vivid gleam. Instead, bloody smears marked disarrayed picnicking gear. We searched for survivors in vain, fear creeping into our psyches. Could it be true, a creature unknown to science, preying on different generations? Suddenly, motion from the corner of my eye resembled an awfully tall, hairy figure with horrifying red eyes glaring at me. Shaking intensely, we tried discussing the situation through stifled breaths. Roan whispered, What do we do? I glanced toward Roan, both of us scanning our surroundings, desperately searching for a viable escape route. We need to call for help, I urged. Roan nodded and frantically dialed the emergency line on his radio. Hello? We need help at Moonlit Meadow. There's some creature. It's hurt or killed people here. We don't know what it is, but please send help immediately. Roan pleaded into the device. All the while, we kept our eyes locked on the looming figure, petrified of what might happen if we looked away. Assured that someone would be dispatched to our location as soon as possible, we hunkered down, keeping ourselves concealed behind a bush only a short distance from the meadow. Tensely gripping our radios, we prayed that help would arrive before the creature noticed our whereabouts. Minutes felt like hours as the creature prowled through moonlit meadow, sniffing the air like a predator searching for its prey. Its unnerving height, at least eight feet, and tangled for covering its body gave off an intimidating aura that only served to intensify our terror. Though either of us was an expert in anthropology or zoology, we hypothesized that this must be an undocumented species in search of sustenance within its territory. But why now? And why had there been no credible encounters with this monstrous being before? With each passing moment, we couldn't shake the feeling that we were being stalked, that the unknown species knew where we were hiding and was simply toying with us. It moved deliberately closer to our location, slowly and methodically. It felt almost deliberate. As its enormous footsteps approached ever nearer, adrenaline coursed through our veins. Unable to suppress our primal instincts any longer, we abandoned our hiding place and ran for dear life through the thick forest vegetation. While sprinting in panic, glancing around for any possible escape, I desperately tried to use my radio to reach the emergency services again. Please hurry! It's changed direction, and now it's chasing us! I practically screamed into the radio. The operator assured us that help was on the way and urged us to keep moving. Roan and I clung to that faint glimmer of hope as we continued our desperate flight through the woods. Through sheer luck or divine intervention— we met up with law enforcement just as they arrived at the scene. Gasping for breath, we informed them of our panicked escape from Moonlit Meadow and the horrifying visage of the unknown beast that had stalked us. Wasting no time, they armed themselves with heavy-duty firearms and marched toward Moonlit Meadow in search of the creature. We remained behind, nerves frayed by our ordeal. Once their operation concluded— a solemn officer returned to tell us they couldn't locate the creature or any trace evidence supporting its existence in Moonlit Meadow after a thorough search. The bloodied remains hinted at some atrocity occurring there, but concrete answers were disturbingly absent. Shaken by what we experienced, and mourning those lost in those dreadful events in Moonlit Meadow, we left those cursed woods that day with more questions than answers. Was it truly an undocumented species preying on generations of innocent victims? We couldn't say, but we knew one thing for certain. We would never set foot in those woods again. 
And so, the mystery persisted terrifying thoughts etched into our minds forevermore. I always considered myself level-headed, the kind who saw stories of hitchhikers on deserted roads as just that, stories. I'm Kylan Morley, a truck driver with more miles on my rig than most planes have in the sky. I haul freight across the vast spans of American highways, and I thought I'd seen it all until that autumn evening in the dense forest of Maine. My route took me on a lesser-known road through a sprawling stretch of wilderness between small, weather-worn towns that barely made it onto maps. Trees like ancient centuries towered over the tarmac, their leaves a firestorm of reds and yellows. It was serene, too quiet for comfort. As dusk approached, the world outside my windshield turned to shades of gray. The radio was my sole companion— aside from the faint hum of my engine and the whispering wind as it raced through the pine needles. I'd been listening to an interview, some author recalling his travels, when Static abruptly swallowed his words, a common annoyance on these remote paths. I focused on the road bending ahead when my headlights caught something, or rather someone, swaying just at its edge. A man stood there, solitary and unmoving in the creeping fog. He was tall and gaunt with skin as pale as birch bark. His clothes hung off his frame in tatters too old-fashioned to be mere thrift store finds. They whispered tales of yesteryear's hardship. My gut twisted into knots. Something about him wasn't right. Yet he might have needed help. Perhaps he was lost or hurt and part of me couldn't simply leave him to the mercy of shadows and cold. The truck slowed to a crawl as I neared him, rolling down my window enough to call out. You need help? My words felt foolish even as they broke free. No answer came. He stood motionless. The air grew colder still, and I shivered against reason's advice to drive away. With a reluctant breath, I'd pulled over and killed the engine, my mind listing every cautionary tale about strangers and deserted roads ever told. The cab door protested with a creak as I stepped onto soft earth damp with dew. The man remained where he stood, an empty look in his eyes, if you could call them eyes, more voids than anything meant for seeing. Perhaps it was just everything around me playing tricks in dim light but no breath seemed to escape him despite the chill. Sir? My voice betrayed my skepticism. His mouth opened as if he might answer, but no sound came forth other than a rough sigh carried off by wind. Only then did something inside me snap, a primal alarm that had lurked under years of logic and scoffing at old wives' tales. In one swift movement that felt both unreal and all too binding by gravity's law, I turned and bolted back toward my truck. Palms slamming against cold metal, I hauled myself up into the cab and jammed the key into ignition. The engine roared to life beneath my boots that hammered against pedals like wild drumbeats urging retreat, escape from whatever this specter of stories best left untold may herald. The darkness pressed in as tires skidded on loose gravel, propelling me back onto the deserted road with frantic urgency. Peering into the rearview mirror, I caught sight of the man I left behind, shape of him distorted, moving faster than any man should. Panic clawed at my chest. Maintaining control of the vehicle with a death grip on the wheel, I pushed the engine to its limits. Logic whispered taunts at me. Was this man sick, in need of help? Why then did he give chase rather than call out for aid? With each mile I put between us, my truck's headlights caught sudden movements, shadows that didn't belong, whispers of silhouettes that hinted at pursuit but never fully revealed their source. The road was long and winding, the nearest town a haven too far for my liking. I checked my phone, signal gone, 
typical for these isolated stretches where towns were small and far between. A call for help wasn't an option. The dashboard clock ticked audibly, a reminder that seconds were slipping by like grains of sand in an hourglass, each one critical. In the empty expanse wrapped around me, it was as if time itself held its breath. I took an abrupt turn off the main road down a narrow path that led to a service station known to me from previous halls. Lights appeared dimly through tree breaks as I approached. The station was closed but not abandoned, a night shift worker present within. Leaping from the truck cab, I didn't stop to shut the door behind me as I barged into the station office. Trouble? The attendant looked up from his magazine with raised eyebrows. Despite my appearance, disheveled and wild-eyed, I managed to convey what little information I had about my pursuer. Wordlessly, he reached for a shotgun under the counter and cocked it, one decisive click of metal against metal that broke the silence like thunder. There we stood for hours until dawn. When police arrived after a vigilant passerby had noted my open door and panicked demeanor upon entering the station, they searched but found no one. No trace of any man existed where I claimed he pursued me, the soft earth by the roadside untouched except for tire marks from where I peeled away. Theories formed and were debated among officers while they sipped coffee outside. Highway hysteria some vagrant lured from isolation, perhaps just tricks of light and sleepless eyes irritating stereotypes and mundane explanations cast over an otherwise inexplicable experience. I went back to life on the road after providing my statement. Such encounters are chalked up to life's unsolved mysteries or passing frights fading like mist under sunrise rays. Days became weeks until reports surfaced drivers vanishing without cause or crime scene evidence aside from idle vehicles by roadsides. Then whispers took form. The name Gavriel murmured between truckers on long-haul frequencies, a name devoid of face or form, spoken not in fear but with certain unease. It clung like burrs on tired tongues when tales turned grave. No knowledge abetted fear nor offered solace to those whose paths crossed unseen lines into unknowable dread. Some spoke less, drove more, others quit entirely. Those disappeared were remembered softly by kin and friends who talked less about Gavriel but thought more. Shadows grew longer with setting suns yet yielded no tangible terror by daybreak's grace. And there it ended— an enigma lingering like fog over black waters whispering secrets one doesn't strain to hear lest they take shape within one's own mind. Time stretched onward, a testament that moments pass despite matters left unsettled or men unmet whose names become ghost stories whispered wearily before sleep claims those long accustomed to life's uncharted roads. Every day felt the same on the road, but not today. My name's Wes Hartshorn, a truck driver hauling loads across vast expanses of contoured asphalt. Today, my run took me through the sprawling openness of Wyoming, where the horizon stretches and yawns with an endless appetite. As I drove past barren lands and over silent hills— my radio companions mentioned a string of peculiar disappearances along Route 30. Disregarding it as local folklore, I kept my mind focused on the humming of my engine and the weight of my cargo. An unexpected detour rerouted me onto a less traveled path, cloaked in tired shadows and whispering winds. Gibo, an old mining town now just a faded imprint on the map, lay ahead untouched by time's eager hands. My family stories often spoke about such places, an uncle who ventured into forgotten towns, only to return with a heavy heart and no tales to tell. The silence here was a living entity on its own, 
watching me with unseen eyes as I steered through the ghost of what once was. Then it happened, a sudden jolt as if my rig had struck something solid. I pulled over beside an abandoned warehouse, its walls scrawny with age, its windows like hollow eyes. Inspecting my vehicle revealed a calamity, a trail of deep red staining the gravel road behind me. Not a car in sight, not a soul within hollering distance. I reached for my phone, the battery life plundered to nothingness. The isolation clenched around me like a vice. In moments like these, logic battled instinct, call for help with what? Nothing but silence answered back. With growing unease swirling in my chest where no emotion dared to emerge, I knew something unnatural was weaving itself into this unusual tableau. Dusk began spilling its ink across the sky as I investigated further, each step measured despite my heart clamoring against its cage. There in the half-light sprawled against cracked concrete lay remnants of cloth and items too personal to belong out here. Rings that once hugged warm fingers, photos that captured laughter now silenced. That's when emptiness gave birth to movement. A figure emerged from behind Gibo's fractured teeth of buildings. A broad-shouldered silhouette limbed by Twilight's last mercy was stalking closer with mechanic precision. A man whose face remained unseen, a stark canvas beneath a shock of tar-black hair. A mutual realization passed between us without words. His intentions were woven into his unhurried gait. He stopped just beyond reach yet close enough for me to decipher the intent written in his stature. He was an omen come to life. Laughter in such situations can be unbidden. Humor finds its way through cracks in our composure where fear should linger instead. What are you gonna do, huh? I joked weakly to myself while reaching uncertainly for the pepper spray kept near my keys, an item never used until now. I hesitated. My fingers grazed the pepper spray. The figure approached, each step deliberate. My heart drummed loud, urging me to run. The street was empty now, the buildings like sentinels to my fear. Why are you here? My voice was a whisper carried away by the breeze. He did not reply but kept moving. I backed away, my palm now sweaty around the pepper spray. In that moment, my phone seemed a lifeline too far away in my pocket, its weight a reminder of how slow time passed when fear took hold. Then I saw it, the glint of metal in his hand. It was not just any metal object. It was long, sharp, unmistakable. A knife. Panic surged. My mind raced for an explanation, but reasons failed to present themselves. His pace quickened. There was no time to call for help. The threat was immediate and closing in. My resolve firmed, and I turned to run. He followed. The chase ensued through alleyways and over fences until breaths became gasps and muscles burned with exertion. Cornered now, my back against cold brick, I braced myself as he loomed over me. His eyes met mine for the first time, cold and dark. This man, this omen, had nothing human behind those eyes. No flicker of compassion or hesitation. He raised the knife. A scream left my lips as I kicked out, the motion dislodging his aim just enough so that steel met brick instead of flesh. The distraction gave me precious moments. I slipped past him, my legs carrying me with newfound desperation towards lights and life, and people who could help. I collided with passers-by who took one look at my face and acted immediately. Calls were made. The police arrived faster than I could process. They apprehended him after what seemed an eternity but must have been moments. I learned later he had a history, escaped from custody while being transferred for treatment from one facility to another, a known psychopath with a pattern of violence so unpredictable it chilled bloods of those who read his file. 
They asked me his name during the investigation that followed. I didn't need to ask. His presence matched his file photo. They called him Markham's Bane in hushed tones at the station, an epithet cruel in its accuracy. By some miracle or by sheer will of survival alone, I survived Arkham's bane with injuries that would heal in time, physical ones at least. The city breathed a little easier that night with him behind bars once more. But some of us knew sleep would be elusive for nights to come as shadows played on our walls and memories lingered longer than welcome visitors. And while life moved on as it does, with an unyielding pace— I occasionally caught myself clutching keys just a little tighter when dusk painted streets with its inky promise that some omens walk among us until fate decides otherwise. Working against the relentless tick of the clock always gave me a sense of urgency as I handled vials of volatile genetic concoctions day in and day out. Yet nothing prepared me for the bone-chilling incident I would come to recount countless times in my hushed tones around the cold, stainless steel tables of our secluded laboratory. I am Dr. Tate Langdon, a name seldom echoed beyond the confinements of classified files and whispered between the concrete walls of the Arbridge, a hush-hush genetic research facility buried deep within the wooded heart of Allegheny National Forest, Pennsylvania. It started out as an inconspicuous Thursday, or at least that's what I perceive it to have been. Mornings at the Arbridge were habitually greeted by a symphony of early bird songs intertwined with the rustic scent of pine and soil that somehow seeped through even the hermetic security doors. Amongst colleagues all too absorbed in their enigmatic tasks to engage in trivia my bonding came in short, lukewarm exchanges with Edris Thorne, the atypically silent janitor who often shared jokes that never failed to elicit a rare chuckle from me. Jokes about how we'd be better off experimenting with joke-telling robots instead of meddling with human genes. Our assignments were discreet and compartmentalized. Every researcher knew just enough to contribute but never enough to piece together the grand puzzle, whatever that was supposed to be. Call it complicity draped in curiosity. We simply didn't ask beyond our pay grades. The running quip about ignorance is bliss was especially apt here. The morning unfolded uneventfully until mid-analysis when Edris burst into my lab without his usual stealthy grace. Dr. Langdon, he gasped, interrupting my scrutiny over synthetic DNA strands. There's something you need to see out back. Fueled by more than mere curiosity, duty perhaps, or was it dread? I followed him past rows of sterile incubators, specimens floating eerily within them like unborn omens. What lay beyond demanded disbelief suspend itself, Calantha Becker, another researcher with whom I shared many silent coffee breaks, was sprawled before us, lifeless on the forest floor not far from our building's somber silhouette. Her body was not just ravaged, it appeared an artist had painted a ghastly tableau with broad strokes of crimson and gaping shadows where her soft features once lay. Edris stood frozen next to me. His eyes couldn't leave Calantha, but mine. Mine started scanning our environs acutely aware that death rarely comes alone in such dreadful splendor. We knew protocol dictated calling for immediate backup. But standing there at nature's gruesome crossroads, any trust we had in unseen handlers evaporated quicker than fog under sunlight. This was not an adversary one could simply radio in about. This demanded discretion born out of sheer instinct for survival. As twilight began its creep, casting elongated shadows between ancient trunks and overgrown brush, we made an unspoken decision to not call for help. Fear made allies out of us and turned reliance on external forces into foolhardiness. We returned inside under an atmosphere heavier than before, intangible yet oppressive like humidity before summer storms. 
Amongst us lay an unsettling consensus. Whatever orchestrated Kalantha's demise wasn't just amongst us but might be born from within walls brimmed with secrets darker than those housed by Pandora's box. Preparations for defense thus began in earnest. Firearms, all rigorously recorded and accounted for, were drawn from seemingly innocuous filing cabinets tucked away behind faux bookshelves. The wonky ceiling light flickered as if on cue when Alaric Seaver walked in tech genius turned survivalist overnight holding a GP-35 handgun awkwardly, as though still debating its morality against imminent need. Our camaraderie stretched only as far as shared fears rather than true bonding. Yet tonight called for uncommon valor bundled tightly with tacit vulnerabilities we each wore under our lab coats like unwanted metals. Our watchful weight blurred into hours tattooed by tension so tangible I swore it left marks upon our skins. Until. It came. I heard it first, a slick, sliding sound outside, the crunch of gravel. We formed a semicircle, backs to one another, watching every door, every window. The power failed. Emergency lights painted everything in stark red tones. Silence fell so deep we heard our own breaths and the pounding of hearts. Harriet turned, her eyes wide. Fingers trembled on the trigger of her firearm as she nodded toward the window. There, pressed against the glass, was a shape, large, hulking. We saw a smear where its breath had fogged the pane. We knew communications were down. Prior attempts at calls for help dead-ended into silence. No signal could pierce the walls we now considered more prison than shelter. Alaric motioned us to fall back to an internal lab, with no windows and fewer doors. Desperation fueled our retreat, and not a soul argued. The door closed, sealed at his command, and not a moment too soon. There was pounding outside— Heavy thuds as something large threw itself against barriers built by human hands with human confidence. Confidence that now seemed misplaced. We checked inventory. A cluster of scientists armed with sidearms and a failing understanding of how reality should behave. We could not rationalize this using knowledge from our field. The first to fall was Eleanor. The door gave way and this creature surged in like nature's fury made flesh. It was powerful, towering over us like some prehistoric behemoth, a maelstrom of claws and teeth that glittered under red light. She screamed, a sudden sharp noise cut short. Blood-painted lab equipment. We stood frozen by sheer terror as survival instincts failed to kick in. Harriet fired next but with hands shaking so much that shots went awry, striking not monster but metal, or air. It advanced unchecked by human effort. We split up instinctively as it barreled through our makeshift barricade, turning tables and instruments into mere toys tossed aside in its path. I caught sight of Harriet again clutching her arm. A gash opened up while warm blood pulsed out in rhythm with her weakening pulses. Paul was fast on his feet, but even he fell, tripped over wire. His head met floor at an angle no neck should bend. Alaric bolted for the calm suite. A plan sparked behind frantic eyes. But he too was snatched up effortlessly. Bones crunched like dry twigs during fall even over our clamor and chaos. Now alone, I understood this creature hunted, stalked within these walls without reason or cause we could comprehend or combat with intellects honed for different battles. In my last moments I crouched beneath a desk, not hiding but waiting without illusion or hope, for claws or teeth or whatever end awaited me here in a house research built upon secrets perhaps buried better unexhumed. And when silence truly fell, I emerged to bodies broken by brute force, not malice, and found an absence that felt more profound than presence had been mere moments before. Later when others found us, what remained, they talked of bear, a beast displaced from habitat due to climate shift 
or human encroachment, one could never be sure. They talked and they theorized, but they weren't there. They didn't see what unfolded within these walls, didn't hear how civilized constructs crumbled under nature's indomitable will, that cared nothing for gunmetal or genius minds. They cleaned. It took days. The horror washed away until sterility returned like false comfort after uneasy dreams. I left then, for comfort proved elusive amidst memories etched into every surface where blood once spilled, in pursuit of solace beyond reach for those who remain only in remembrance now. Eleanor's resolve, Harriet's courage, Paul's swiftness, all overcome by inexorable fate and Alaric's ingenuity quashed before fruition and I carry them with me, their end, and the silent acknowledgment that there are things we are meant merely to witness, not understand, and certainly not conquer. There's a certain comfort in routine, the kind that allows you to navigate your day with the assurance of predictability. I'd grown accustomed to this quiet hum of certainty as I drove down the secluded access road toward my place of work, a confidential government facility buried deep in the thickets of Alaska's wilderness, far from prying eyes. My assignment was as thrilling as it was top secret, genetic experiments aimed at pushing the boundaries of modern science. My name is Lysander Hawk and my colleagues were just as uniquely named, individuals like Calliope Troy or Elwood Brandt, each chosen not only for their intelligence but also for their ability to handle isolation and discretion. We all shared a gallows humor about our unusual profession, cracking jokes about how we were more likely to discover Santa Claus out here than any revolutionary scientific breakthrough. On that particular morning, I found Blythe Caldwell, our biochemist, standing over a series of petri dishes like a magician ready to dazzle an audience with his next trick. Ready to play God today, Lysander? she asked, her question teetering between jest and existential pondering. I responded with my own jab. Only if I get to control who gets smitten but the grin plastered on my face dissipated when we heard a distant clamor outside the secure walls of our facility. It sounded gut-wrenching, an anguished bellow that didn't belong to any creature known in these woods or any other for that matter. Calliope and Elwood joined us as we peered through the safety glass windows. We knew the risks outside these walls carried. The wild was unforgiving and alien but what greeted us was something even more unsettling, an amalgamation of animal and nightmare. It stood on two appendages that could hardly be called legs, its silhouette imprinted against the dense fog like a folkloric fiend realized in flesh. We couldn't call for help. Radio signals died against the mountainside, lost like whispers in a blizzard. The creature's presence sent whispers of panic through our ranks. Though none dared voice it aloud, we all thought it. This monstrosity might be linked to our experiments, an error manifest from the shadows of human hubris. Blythe hesitantly brandished her small sidearm, protection against potential wildlife threats, as we strategized in subdued tones. We were government employees, not field agents or soldiers. We hadn't been trained for confrontations with cryptid-like creatures. The decision was made. We would attempt to contain it before word got out and our research saw daylight. Armed with nothing but firearms and trepidation masquerading as courage, we made our move into the woods where shadows clung like cobwebs and the silence sang hymns of unseen dangers. Progress was slow. Every rustle of leaves underfoot felt like an announcement to our presence, an invitation to become prey ourselves. Time stretched taut between each labored breath we dared take when finally, Elwood signaled a halt. He'd spotted it some yards ahead. Despite our intent on approaching undetected, some wretched luck saw us discovered. 
the beast turned its grotesque visage upon us. Its eyes burned with an eldritch flame as though ignited by underworld fires themselves. The air grew bitter with the stench of decay wafting from its gaping maw, a grave warning unheeded by adrenaline-fueled instincts. Chaos erupted as it charged with terrifying agility. Claws tore through earth while teeth gleamed beneath lightning strikes illuming this nightmarish tableau. We scattered desperately. Gunshots punctured still air attempting futility against such raw, primordial fury. Blythe! Calliope screamed as foreboding snaps echoed. Bones or branches one couldn't tell amidst this dance macabre unfolding in Alaska's forgotten thrive. There was no time for strategy now. Survival instinct usurped all semblance of teamwork or composure once professed at mission outset. I scrambled behind a tree, my chest heaving for breath. Elwood nodded to me and we bolted in opposite directions. The creature roared, a deafening sound that shook the very ground under us. It was not of any species we knew. This much was clear by the elongated limbs and the speed at which it moved. Calliope, move! I shouted, hoping she would follow our lead. She did. But the creature was fast, much faster than any of us. It snapped a tree like a twig as it passed, its focus on Blythe who had tripped over a root. There was a gut-wrenching scream. I couldn't see what happened. My only thought was to find cover and evade this beast. We regrouped, minus Blythe. Our phones were useless here. No signal penetrated these woods. Our isolation by design had turned against us. Flares, Elwood said abruptly. We need rescue. Calliope fumbled with trembling hands to release a flare into the sky. Its piercing red cry split the night. We huddled together waiting for salvation or doom, uncertain which would find us first. Hours or mere minutes might have passed when we heard footsteps distinct from the creature's heavy gait human footsteps. Rescue arrived, armed and alarmed by our distress signal. They asked about Blythe, and all we could do was point toward the chaos of disturbed foliage and broken trees where last we'd seen her. The report detailed an attack by an unidentified animal. Blythe's body told a tale no living person witnessed, her injuries severe, beyond anything local wildlife could inflict. The events were documented clinically, methodically. Time of death undetermined. Cause of death extensive trauma consistent with animal attack. No assumptions of species made it to official records. As for the rest of us, relief at being alive warred with guilt for surviving something Blythe could not. We leave Alaska carrying scars unseen. Memories of a hunt that turned us into hunted a reminder that some things in this world defy explanation. In the end, we return to lives forever altered by an unknown horror in Alaskan wilderness, the true nature of our attacker relegated to speculation since its existence defies known science. We didn't go back. Some things are better left alone. The missing are mourned but they are free from fear now a luxury those who remember can never reclaim. I remember that evening like it was yesterday. I had just finished a long day of work at the local lumber mill, and my friend Donnie Hardwick had invited me to his remote cabin for a relaxing getaway. Donnie was that rare and peculiar type of person who could always land on his feet no matter how difficult life got. We were driving down a winding forest road in upstate New York. The tall trees cast eerie shadows on the ground, while the sun retreated below the horizon. Donnie's cabin was situated in a quiet clearing surrounded by dense woods. We took pleasure in sharing stories and laughing about our workdays as the night pressed on. The fire crackled in its pit, providing warmth and inviting us to unwind with another beer. 
As we talked into the night, we gradually became aware of an unsettling noise coming from the woods. It sounded like two rocks were grinding against each other. Donnie and I exchanged nervous glances, but we didn't say anything at first. We wanted to believe it was just our imagination. The sound intensified closer this time, and my nerves began to shout as panic bubbled up within me. I attempted to make light of the situation with a joke, anything to mask our growing apprehension, but it fell flat in the face of our unease. Maybe we should call for help. I suggested hesitantly, reaching for my cell phone. However, Donnie reminded me that cell service here was practically non-existent due to the cabin's secluded nature. As the grinding noise approached even closer, we realized that our best chance at survival would be to rely on our instincts and reaction speeds, qualities born out of numerous years working with machinery and cutting timber in the mill. The creature emerged from the darkened woods on all fours, a hulking beast unlike anything I'd ever seen before. Its skin glistened like raw meat under the moonlight, with patches of decomposing fur decorating the rest of its body. Its teeth were jagged, broken, and lined up improperly, yet still promising a painful end to anyone who got too close. Donnie scrambled for a hunting rifle he kept hidden in the cabin and I retrieved a rusted knife from my utility belt. We faced the mangled creature head-on, but remained unable to move, our eyes locked onto its grotesque form in horror. Our minds raced. The practical knowledge we had accumulated over the years now failed us in the face of the abominable beast. Why hadn't we packed more effective weapons? Was there any way to signal for help beyond the forest's murmurs? The creature let out a guttural roar and charged straight at us. With adrenaline pumping through my veins, I swung the knife wildly while Donnie leveled his rifle. We were ready to confront this nightmare. As bullets ripped through air and rusty blade met rotting flesh, it was impossible to ignore the overwhelming terror lurking beneath every desperate strike. The sudden onslaught had made us realize that our lives were on the line that there was so much more to fear than just an unsettling noise in the woods. We continued battling this horrifying creature while struggling to preserve the bonds that tied us together, our love for our families, our shared experiences at work, and our drive to survive against all odds. Through every gunshot, slash, and gut-wrenching scream that echoed in those dark woods, one thing resonated loudly— we fought not just for ourselves but for a safer world than what awaited us should we perish. Though our foe seemed undying and relentless in its pursuit of chaos and carnage, Donnie and I held firm in our conviction that we could persevere. The hope that courses through every human heart, that drive for life, we shared with those who would never know about our harrowing encounter with terror personified. Between bursts of gunfire— I thought back to how I faced life's struggles, as a lumber mill worker with perpetual strife and laughter, all merging into a single moment that forced me to confront my fears. The creature roared once more, its decayed body covered in bullet holes and slashed with makeshift weaponry. This abomination of reality was tireless and relentless in its pursuit of destruction. It had taken many lives— its gruesome appetite never seemed to be sated, and it was clear that it would take as many as it could before leaving behind a murderous path. In the midst of the terrifying battle, I felt despair slowly seeping in. There were too many times we were close to being caught by the monstrous creature. The close encounters were too many to count, and I couldn't shake the feeling that it was merely a matter of time before one of us was the next victim. As we battled further into the night, the creature's rage only seemed to grow stronger as our strength waned. Finally, sensing an opportunity to escape, I shouted at Donnie with urgency. We need to split up and distract it. It's our best chance. Donnie hesitated, but
but ultimately agreed with my plan. We devised a quick strategy. He would continue shooting at the creature while I ran in the opposite direction. This way, one of us could call for help while the other tried to lure the monster away from both of us. And so we separated. I sprinted through the woods, listening for any sounds behind me. I could hear gunshots in the distance, and hoped that Donnie was keeping the creature at bay. My legs grew weary and my lungs burned as I pushed through my exhaustion. Suddenly, a rustling in nearby bushes alerted me to a figure appearing from behind them, an elderly man dressed in tattered clothing who studied me cautiously yet curiously. He spoke urgently. You need help. I nodded anxiously, knowing that time was running out. Without hesitating or explaining further, he guided me through obscured paths in direction opposing Donnie and away from this terrible creature's range. We arrived at a house, and the man motioned for me to keep quiet as he opened the door. Inside was an elderly woman sitting in a wooden chair, her gray hair framing her weathered face. She seemed to have been expecting us. What you're facing is called the Wendigo, she whispered, her voice urgent. It's a creature of legend. At least, I thought it was just a story. She continued, explaining that the Wendigo was a spirit once human who had consumed flesh and transformed into an insatiable monster. According to local folklore, it would kill indiscriminately, its hunger never-ending. We have to save my friend! I exclaimed, suddenly reminded that Donnie was still out there with the Wendigo. Together, we hatched a plan to rescue Donnie from the Wendigo's deadly grasp. The elderly woman provided us with rudimentary weapons and sound devices which could help distract it enough to retrieve Donnie and Scathe. With extreme caution and determination, we reached an area echoing with gunshots. There, Donnie had stood resolutely against the monstrous beast while trying his best to avoid its increasingly furious onslaught. The creature seemed exhausted, its movements sluggish. With heart pounding in my chest, I activated the noise-making devices and instantly drew its attention away from Donnie. Once distracted, we hurriedly led him back to safety, the Wendigo distracted only momentarily by the unfamiliar sounds attacking its sensitive ears. We made it back to house successfully. With the knowledge provided by our newfound allies on how to repel the creature temporarily from habited areas by using specialized talismans, we decided we needed to warn people about this deadly legend come true. The events of our terrible encounter etched deeply into our memories will always evoke terror when silenced by dark nights and unfamiliar forests, a stark reminder that some legends should not be forgotten or dismissed as myth. But with vigilance, unity, and the power of newfound knowledge, we won't let our lives succumb to the horrors of the Wendigo. And so, the battle continued, a timeless struggle to protect what is most important to all of us, our loved ones, our lives and our hopes for a brighter future free from eternal fear and suffering. In those darkest hours when faced with an unstoppable enemy, we found strength in ourselves and each other. We fought not just for our own survival but for generations to come, refusing to let the Wendigo's gruesome nightmares become the reality that consumes us all. The first time I saw the thing, it was just a blur in the dark. My name is Elson, a fire lookout stationed at the Chena River State Recreation Area in Alaska. Life up here breeds a certain kind of solitude, but I never felt alone, not really. Until that night. The job meant staying vigilant, scanning for signs of fire in acres of wilderness, but nothing prepares you for when the natural order skews. It was a Tuesday when tragedy struck a mile from my tower. Two hikers, seasoned and no strangers to these woods, 
were found mangled not by bears or some delinquent looking for trouble. The wounds were precise, surgical almost, as though their bodies were a canvas for some deranged artist. The authorities were baffled. This area knew the wrath of nature, but not of man. Their names were Baxter and Aurelia, curious monikers for an even more peculiar pairing of souls whose bright lanterns no longer flickered in the dark. As days passed and investigators scoured through evidence, I couldn't shake off this eerie feeling that those woods watched me with unseen eyes. Stillness greeted every creak of my cabin steps and hushed whispers danced at the edges of my consciousness. Then it happened again. Another scream echoed in the cold night air different spot, same brutal aftermath. This time it was a local fisherman named Casper whose heart no longer echoed against the river where he used to stand. He was respected, an anchor in his community, now reduced to silent screams imprinted on his face. A pattern wove itself into existence. It came every full moon, two days ahead each time as if taunting us to catch it before its next masterpiece. Tensions rose among locals and visitors alike. Whispers turned to theories. Accusations flew like dry leaves caught in an updraft. Nerves stretched tight. I barely slept at night and instead watched for any sign of movement or anomaly that might reveal this creature's identity. It walked on two legs, that much was clear from prints left behind, but its form remained elusive, shrouded whenever I tried to focus on its shape blending into trees as if mocking my feeble attempts to make sense of its existence. I kept logs of everything I observed, times, weather conditions, behaviors, anything that provided insight into what we're dealing with. Fueled by fear and caffeine, I scoured over notes under dim lamplight trying to piece together this morbid puzzle until my mind throbbed with exhaustion. My only reprieve came through brief exchanges over crackling radios or chance encounters with Ruthie, the ranger whose smile fought hard against current events, at supply drops which became more scarce with each passing incident. Days passed since Casper's demise. The pattern held. Food deliveries stopped. The town was alone with its terror. I no longer ventured out at night. Instead, I secured doors and windows. Ruthie reached out over radio, advised the same. One moonlit night, terror struck anew. A scream split the silence, then another, chilling, human agony. A rush to the scene revealed a sight grim and bloody, limbs askew life extinguished. It was Mayor Jennings, a leader now lost. We stopped speaking of future plans. The creature struck heart and once vibrant community spirits. Our existence turned into survival, nothing more. The creature loomed closer every encounter, a towering figure, limbs long and mangled, formatted with what could only be blood from previous hunts. Its eyes were hollows in the night. Its breaths were ragged rasps that chilled bones. Calls for help went out, desperate cries on every available channel. But answers waned as contact with the outside world grew thin. Each screamed into the void. No reply came. The creature's work grew bolder. It left marks, clawed messages on tree trunks, a sickening display of dominance and threat. Soon Ruthie stopped responding to radio calls. Her last words were rushed pleas for evacuation. Then silence followed. I remained silent too, waiting, listening. The dreadful anticipation was worse than any sight or sound. On its last visit, it came not for another but for me. With nowhere to run, I stood still as death itself approached with inevitable stride. Its form loomed over me, eight feet tall at least. Claws sharp like blades of grass after frostbite scratched earth beneath its weight. Breath hot and rank assaulted senses while moonlight glinted off saliva dripping from exposed fangs. 
I stared into eyes that knew no mercy nor reason, merely hunger that spelled a cruel end for many before and perhaps now for me. It struck not with tooth or claw but a force that sent me sprawling meters away. Pain erupted as I struck hard ground while it turned away to follow some unseen whim or thought known only to itself. Injured but alive, I stayed down as it disappeared into night mist leaving only torn clothing evidence of its nearness to ending life's thread. Survivors gathered next day at dawn's first light by riverside where once fish teemed with abundance and spoke of loss we bore witness to along with strength found in direst times when human spirit faced against indomitable force of nature's darkest corner dwellers. We remembered those taken by this terror. Their life stories became lessons, warnings etched into community soul that would forever look upon full moons not with awe but wary minds knowing what might lurk just beyond edge of light cast into shadows deep where nightmares tread heavy-footed through reality's fragile weave. I had taken a job as a fire lookout in the remote wilderness of Oregon, replacing old Mac who retired after thirty years. My cabin stood perched atop a craggy outcrop overlooking acres of dense forest. The isolation was intentional. I wanted to divorce myself from the world after Jenna's departure. It gave me quiet too much, maybe. One uneventful afternoon, filtering sunlight through the conifers, I heard a report crackling over the radio of an unusual incident in a nearby town. An esteemed professor from the local college had been found, not by his name Landon but by his screams that cut through the resident's daily hum. He'd collapsed in what seemed like a meticulously excavated circle in the woods, dead for reasons invisible to the bare eye. The days that followed were edged with unease. I caught glimpses of something darting between trees, too fast and silent to be human or animal as we classify them. I started taking notes whenever I spotted it, gaunt frame, moves at dusk, vanishes near Harkins Ridge, conversations with my solitary neighbor across the radio waves became my solace. Darby, a wildlife biologist part-time sound tracker, shared tips on tracking elusive fauna with sly jokes interspersed. If it ain't leaving tracks or scat, it ain't worth finding. He laughed one evening, unaware of my growing obsession. One balmy night shook me from sleep branches snapping under deliberate weight, close to my cabin. Fumbling for my binoculars, each sweep across the tree lean felt slower than the last. It wasn't hiding anymore. I could see it standing ever so slightly off-kilter on hind legs not intended for such use, observing me as I was it. The creature wasn't outwardly alien. Its menace came from its near humanity, the same unsettling visage one might experience when stumbling upon violative crime scene photos where you hope never to see such things. Days slipped into nights filled with terror veiled by normalcy. Notes escalated into maps festooned with strings tethering together sightings and incidents. It became clear, this creature hunted with intelligence, stealthily spiraling towards me at the center. Darby's reports grew tense and then stopped altogether. My radio crackles now from other lookouts asking if I've heard from him. Tonight, as red embers paint my lonely panorama, Resignation seeps into my bones heavier than smoke. Bootstrapped tight, map clutched with white knuckles, I prime myself not to escape but to confront, with truth or madness clenched like a torch against an encroaching night that holds more than darkness. Crisp leaves speak underfoot while shadows cast doubt along my path to Harkins Ridge, a place now bearing the mark of profanities against nature and man's complacency towards his neighbor's plight. I reached Harkins Ridge by dawn, the ground crunched beneath my boots. The forest lay quiet, eerily still. There I saw it, 
the creature that haunted my nights. Its form was grotesque, a mockery of human shape with too many joints bending at wrong angles, skin sallow and stretched over protruding bones. Eyes deep and dark as voids fixed on me with a predatory stare. I didn't dare to go closer. My hand clasped the radio, but I hesitated. Who would believe this call? Images of disbelief on men's faces kept me silent. When it moved toward me, limbs cracked like dry wood in a slow, macabre dance. I turned and ran, knowing the futility of it all. In the end, it caught up swiftly. The terror was clinical. Incisors tore flesh with precision while its hands pinned me down. They found me later, mauled but alive. Whispered tales of a bear attack filled the air. But bears don't leave marks shaped like human hands. No one spoke of Darby anymore. He never resurfaced after that day. People feared what they didn't understand. Their silence buried him deeper than any grave could. Healing took time, but wounds left scars both seen and unseen. I left the lookout life behind. What happened at Harkins Ridge remains a harrowing memory that lingers. In the end, creatures lived among us whether acknowledged or not. And life somehow continued, humbled by fragility and fear of roots snapping underfoot in the dark. Every morning, I wake up before the sun perches high in the sky, my boots crunching over brittle leaves and wayward sticks as I begin my rounds through Miller's Forest. The vast expanse of gnarled trees and underbrush is my responsibility. But that day, as I patrolled the western edge near Culver's Creek, something felt off. My name is Arlo Beaumont and this forest has been my second home since I left the army a decade ago. Out here, everything usually sits in its rightful place under the sun and moon. But that particular morning, silence clung too heavy for comfort. While adjusting my radio on my hip, I caught sight of what at first glance seemed like an oddly shaped shadow near the creek bed. I approached cautiously, radio forgotten, there lay a backpack, shredded and contents spilled as if tossed aside by a careless giant. Amongst tattered clothing and broken gadgets was a journal belonging to someone named Phillips Crenshaw, a name that never made the local news or any missing person report. The scratched-up journal jaggedly recounted Phillips' excitement about hiking trails undocumented on any map he could find. As a ranger, frustration simmered inside me. Unregistered trailblazing was reckless at best. Flipping through distress-tinged entries confirmed that something hunted him, a predator he referred to only as stalking terror. I radioed base for backup, but reception gave way to static. Communication towers never fare well against Miller's forest-dense canopies. My mind grazed on protocols for such findings, a search and rescue operation now shadowed by dread. Phillips might be days ahead, or mere steps from where I stood. Continuing deeper into the untamed woods, scanning for signs of life or those heralding an end, each snap twig beneath my step jarred my senses more than it should. Trails seemed to shift like serpents beneath foliage confoundingly elusive even to an experienced eye like mine. Hours slipped past before another clue presented itself not in objects, but in sounds barely distinguishing themselves from nature's murmur, a distant sobbing suppressed by thick air. There are kin rations and spare batteries in my pack, yet they grow useless without human presence needing salvation. The balance between hunter and guardian defines my ethos out here. This unseen entity seemed to jeer at that balance with invisible weight. Those skeptical of myths spun around campfires by veterans speaking of creatures born from darkness itself, skepticism failed to shield me from creeping anxieties their tales bestowed. 
frozen footfalls became tail beats, hurried rushes towards shattering peace, yet nothing garnered sight except trickling sweat beneath midday heat. The ecosystem whispered secrets indiscernible to human ears, all while a malevolence lurked within dismal silhouette hidden somewhere behind hazy outlines. Mangled flora bordered where imagination blurred into witnessing reality, evidence of chaos sculpted with violent precision, an aberration existing outside known predator's modus operandi, a harbinger darkly unique unto itself. Signal fire smoke veils sun splinters casting their judgment upon efforts to unveil this new threat. It consumes courage while staring braveries advance forward. The sun sank lower, casting shadows over the broken terrain. In the quiet, a sudden, guttural snarl shattered the fragile silence. I froze, listening intently. Branches cracked, and something large moved through the undergrowth. I had no weapon except for the radio communicator in my pack. The decision was swift. To call for help would reveal my location. Hiding seemed wiser. Another snarl, closer this time. There was movement to my right, a beast unlike any known to local forestry, large, covered with coarse fur, with eyes reflecting a malignant intelligence. Teeth bared in warning. It paced deliberately, muscles rippling under its skin, a predator confident in its domain. I backed away, each step careful to avoid noise, but it advanced in sync. Fear suggested it smelled my desperation. Logic dictated it hunted by sight and sound. The radio remained and used in my pack. Its signal might reach others too late, or not at all given the thickness of the forest canopy. Moreover, noise would attract the creature immediately upon me. In a clearing ahead lay a ravine. A plan formed swiftly. Reach it and descend to evade pursuit. I darted forward but branches slashed across my path as if manipulated by an unseen force. The creature roared behind me. Its hunt escalated into a chase. I slid down the bank of the ravine with scrapes and cuts as tokens of escape. At the bottom ran a shallow stream that could mask my scent and tracks. For hours I stumbled along beneath the moon that now ruled the sky. By dawn, exhausted but alive, I encountered a search party sent out after my prolonged silence on patrol routes. They listened intently as I reported an unknown predator in the woods. Evidence found in flora and one hunter's fractured body confirmed it, bones clean expertly of flesh, his tools scattered around him. The conclusion was neither definitive nor satisfying only speculation that some undocumented species evaded human detection until now. The search for this creature started immediately but caution was urged, its capabilities largely unknown but obviously lethal. Back at base camp, relief washed over survivors as they recounted narrow escapes from that which hunted outside our realm of knowledge. One truth echoed clear, man might not be apex predator out here anymore. When night fell again we watched fires burn high and bright. Charred wood crackled warnings that safety lay only within light's embrace while darkness concealed horrors reborn anew each sundown. Remembrances etched lasting tributes for lives lost to this enigmatic threat less time encourage forgetfulness about dangers lurking beyond civilization's frail boundaries, reminding us that not all shadows whisper empty threats some conceal teeth ready to rend flesh from bone and wilderness untamed heart. I always thought a watch was just a watch until I found the one with inscriptions I couldn't read. My name is Sanders Legrand, a park ranger stationed in the dense forests of the Olympic National Park. Here, in the damp greenery where silence often speaks louder than words, my life unfolded in rays of dappled sunlight and shadows that played tricks on us all. 
One morning, routine as any other, I stumbled upon a hiker's abandoned campsite. The tent was shredded, gear strewn everywhere. It looked like a wild animal had its way. But the claw marks? Too precise. Calling for help crossed my mind, yet something stopped me. Who would believe this wasn't just a bear? I made meticulous mental notes on everything I saw, however gruesome. The following weeks held an eerie quiet. Campers reported items missing from their sites and odd noises at night that didn't belong anywhere within these woods. Colleagues of mine, Carter Morello and Marissa Quinn, exchanged skeptical glances whenever these tales came up. We were rangers, after all, not ones to jump at bump in the night folklore. Life had gotten peculiar since my wife passed. The forest was both my refuge and reminder of her joyous spirit that used to hike these trails with me. The sense of loss never left me but kept hidden behind duties and the facade of routine checks. But every facade cracks. Mine did when I discovered another mauled tent nestled near Quinault River's rushing waters. Inside, a watch clutched within what used to be a hand— the timepiece oddly intact amongst the chaos. Whispers of digits around its edge looked almost like coordinates. That night was moonless, a shroud where the beam of only my flashlight cut through opacity as I wandered past familiar trees gone foreign with suspicion. A guttural growl rumbled through thick underbrush somewhere off to my right, and any skepticism left inside me faltered then gave way entirely. Shapes moved, or did they? Just beyond the reach of light so certain shadows seemed more substantial than others. In them was an insidious suggestion of presence. All those signs we'd ignored or rationalized. They spelled something out now, and it wasn't just random predation. I radioed Carter and Marissa to meet me here at first light. After all, there's safety in numbers a notion I clung to that endless night. They arrived silent but clearly unnerved by our unheard-of situation out here under colossal trees where the canopy concealed more than just sky, a place where comfort turned alien real fast. Should we call this in? Marissa asked as we surveyed another scene void of laughter that once reverberated around campfires. No, Carter interjected before I could agree. We handle it ourselves for now. It was an unspoken acknowledgement between us. This was beyond comprehension, beyond protocol. We wound deeper into Hartwood territory. Maps became suggestions rather than guides while we sought out whatever was eluding us with such cunning malice. It hunted us as much as we hunted it. There came moments where our eyes locked, aware we had become prey ourselves and it thrilled whoever or whatever stalked us from unseen vantage points. As midday gave way to dusk's first breaths there came a clarity draped in dread for me. We were part of something ancient, a cycle untouched by years extending back past human memory. Yet still we trudged on grim determinism worn plainly across our faces like badges, badges worthless against nightmares made flesh within these woods whispering with secrets, far older than any legend spoken by men or penned by poets. We moved in silence, scanning our surroundings, our radios off. We used hand signals. Our focus stayed razor sharp. Carter signaled us to stop. Ahead, branches moved. We saw a silhouette. It was large, bulky, and it walked upright. Its eyes reflected light with a predatory glow. We couldn't identify it. Marissa gestured back the way we came. We nodded. Retreat was our only option. As we moved, I glanced over my shoulder. The creature followed us with ease, as though it knew the forest much better than we could ever hope to. Carter pointed to his radio and then to his head. He wanted to call for help but feared the noise would provoke an attack. I shook my head in agreement. We couldn't risk it. We reached a clearing and paused to catch our breath. 
the creature's presence always felt but never seen. Sweat dripped down my forehead but I wiped it away quickly, keeping my hands free. I felt Marissa's hand on my shoulder and turned to see her pointing at a nearby ranger tower, an escape. We sprinted to the tower as branches cracked behind us, the creature close on our heels. I climbed the ladder first while Carter and Marissa covered me from below. Once up, I reached down to pull Marissa up next. A scream pierced the air below just as Marissa reached the top. I looked down in horror as Carter fought with the creature. It had him by the leg with claws that dug deep into flesh. Its mouth gaped open revealing rows of serrated teeth like those of a bear trap. Marissa tried to climb down to him, but I held her back. Carter was gone before we could reach him. The creature dragged him off into the woods, leaving behind a trail of blood. We stayed overnight in the tower, listening until the forest fell silent again. At dawn, exhausted and still in shock, we made it back using the high ground of ridges and clearings, no cover for whatever took Carter. Once safe, we called for help on a landline at base camp. Radio communication had failed us when we needed it most. The search team found Carter's remnants later that day. I stayed long enough to give my report but decided my time in those woods was over right after his funeral service last Thursday. Now I sit at home writing this account so that there's some record of what happened out there. It's not for closure or understanding. Some things defy both. Carter was brave, but he didn't deserve that fate. No one does. Those woods hold something real and dangerous. A lesson learned too late by us all. In memory of Carter Jameson, a colleague, ranger, friend. His laughter echoes louder than any campfire tale now, gone but never forgotten amidst nature's unresolved mysteries.